public comment, if any. We'll hear from our uh, town manager in terms of his weekly update. We have a proclamation tonight regards the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have a number of action items, including uh, a, re a discussion again of the hazard mitigation plan that we uh, discussed in our last meeting with a series of inputs that I and I'm, I'm sure others had made uh, in terms of improvements and corrections. Uh, we'll approve a um, uh, proposed fiscal 18 board of selectmen schedule. We'll review a proposed uh, Reading Wakefield real estate sale. We'll review the town manager's uh, FY17 goals and uh, likewise draft goals for FY18. We'll establish the town manager's evaluation process. We have a, a discussion on the uh, candidate survey that's come before us a couple of times. It's now got our collective inputs and is in a, a <coughs> more robust form than it was initially. We have a change of officer at Chili's, an approval of minutes from the 13th. And then we'll uh, um, adjourn to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to bargaining approximately 9.35. With that, I'll um, accept any liaison reports. Andrew? Um, I don't have any per se. I did go to a couple of meetings with you and uh, an HRAP meeting, which we can talk about or you can present, and um, the uh, FinCom meeting that four of us went to, and I'm, we're going to be discussing that. So nothing else. We'd like to talk more about the HR I mean, side. Um, <clears throat> it was in the library, a small group of people, I think five or six people, and they brought up uh, some of their <clears throat> sort of their desires, and I'll let them speak. I don't want to speak for them, but <clears throat> I think they concisely relayed what they were looking for, and uh, you invited them to come to a meeting at, at some point. Yep. Sure. Anything else? That's it. That's it. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, I was at the FinCom meeting as well. Nothing else to report. Um, Jeff? Um, well, uh, I do have a, a, a small update on um, the Recreation Committee, although I'm seldom able to meet their meetings because they meet often at the same time we do. But um, there's some proposals in front of them really tied to the Birch Meadow um, Master Plan. Little League is interested in donating and upgrading, you know, a current baseball cage and also added add another one. Um, all good stuff uh, as far as that's concerned. And um, so the we're going to actually uh, the I'm going to be meeting next week with the Birch Meadow uh, subcommittee um, to have some discussions about that and see how it all matches. And so that's kind of ongoing, you know, um, really recreational. Um, <coughs> items more than anything else so uh, down at uh, Memorial Park one of the things that's happened is that um, the bandstand had to be cordoned off I don't know if you've noticed if anybody's okay. noticed that or yeah. not um, the um, it's it's in decay uh, you know and it's you know there's been several looks at this thing over time and it presents some real tripping hazards you know for people that are there it's it's no small project. I mean, it's um, it's it's quite a big project actually. But uh, so we're gonna, you know, we'll be talking about that too, and I'll bring back a report and see where we are. So that's that's really all I have for now. Thank you, John. Um, <coughs> Andrew said uh, he and I both met with the uh, Human Relations Advisory Committee. The subject matter largely revolved around the um, Selectman's policy under which the HRAC is. Advisory to the Board of Selectmen and uh, ways that we could go forward and particularly clarify <coughs> how, the, how that board and our board seek to work together going forward. Um, likewise, I attended the same um, Finance Committee meeting as Barry did on a couple of um, um, additional transfers of money to help with some year end expenses, um, fairly formulaic stuff. With that, I'll open it up for a public comment, if any. Anyone for public comment? Just raise your hand and very good. Bob, any comments? Um, just two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, an update on state aid. Um, you've seen documents flying out of the state in the last uh, week or so. Um, the state aid number that's uh, coming out of conference committee and going to the governor's desk is 102,000 below our estimate of 2.5%. That's something we already knew uh, at April town meeting and factored in, so there's essentially no, no problem there. State assessments are up 50. 4,000 
So it's interesting. We assumed up 2.5% for each. State aid is up less than 2%. State assessments are up 11%. So that went the wrong direction on, on both. Uh, but again, that number is, is rounding error from what we had assumed. So it's fine. Um, I, I have to say that given the difficulty of the budget process, and I have not reached out to legislators in nearly a month, and they have had no time, I'm sure, for anything other than the budget. Uh, I really do appreciate the fact that the budget that was hammered out uh, left local aid intact. Uh, clearly, that should have been and could have been and would have been prior years, but on the table. Um, to balance the budget with such an amazing ref revenue uh, shortfall that you know, sort of got re realized last minute is a really remarkable thing. And I have not ready, read any analysis of the budget. I've just read through line items um, and it would appear to me that they have um, um, really reduced a lot of social services, except for veterans. Um, that was the one group that uh, costs went up, and they protected uh, a lot of health insurance. And I think they really have no choice about. It. So, you know, to protect municipal local aid uh, in such a budget was really um, certainly very welcome and very much appreciated. <coughs> um, the other is is some very sad news, um, not necessarily Reading, but still very important. Um, we've been working with Woburn over the last couple of years as kind of a sister city working on a library project. They're a couple of years behind us. And uh, today, I'd just like to ask for a quick moment of silence. One of the construction workers actually died on site. He was, he was hit by a boulder, and OSHA is now on site uh, investigating. And that harkened back to an incident that happened during our project where the project manager was hit by a piece of plywood that flew off the roof, and it just grazed his foot and put him in a cast for six or eight weeks. And, you know, he said, I could have been easily killed. So, you know, we talk about public construction, and gee, it's terrible how it goes so slow and it costs too much money. There's worse things that can happen. And if you will, I'd just like to ask for a moment to recognize that worker, and certainly we send out our sympathies to him and his family. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move to our first article for the evening is the uh, Proclamation for the Americans with Disabilities Act. John, if I could get that for me? Sure. Um, we have a motion? Yep. Move that the Board of Selectmen declare July 26, 2017 as Americans with Disabilities Act Day. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. Um, I'll read the proclamation for those uh, at home. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act Day, whereas July 26 marks the 27th anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and where the town of Reading celebrates the contributions that people with disabilities have made and continue to make, and the town renews its commitment to upholding the non-discrimination principles of the ADA, and where many organizations locally, regionally, and nationally work tirelessly to support citizens with disabilities, and those organizations deserve the recognition, respect, and support of their communities for this service. We, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim July 26, 2017 as Americans with Disability Act Day in the Town of Reading and urge all citizens to support the efforts of the Independent Living Center of the North Shore and Cape Ann Incorporated, which is the voice of all persons with disabilities and their families. This proclamation is an acknowledgement of the rights of all persons with disabilities under the ADA and their daily activities, struggles, and triumphs here in the town of Reading. Um, so that's the proclamation. Is there anyone here to receive this tonight, Bob? No. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments from the board? If not, um, all those in favor of the proclamation? Or zero? Um, you guys would like to go ahead and start signing. That'd be great. Um, next, we'll move on. While that's going around, we'll move on to the. Um, Actually, Hazard mitigation. Yeah, we're a little bit ahead of the That's time. That's okay. Um, in our meeting of two weeks ago, we had a discussion on what I'd call an early version of the mitigation plan, and a number of us put forth uh, improvement suggestions, and uh, I believe we've got a version of the improved plan tonight, as well as somebody here to... Right. Uh, Julie and our rep. Oh, hi, Julie. I didn't see you. Sorry. That's why I abdicated there. Yes. Why don't you come on up and... Uh... We have Martin Pillsbury from NHC. Hi, Martin. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank you. So 
this is this is uh, 2.0 we're looking at here tonight yeah yes well actually uh, I guess some change Julie had passed some comments Sam Cleaves who's the at MAPC who's the author of the plan originally made a series of changes based on those comments that we got I guess last week uh, I think maybe that's what you have here. Yes. Uh, but then Julie passed on to me some additional comments yesterday. Yeah, my bad. I, I had realized I'd been away all the 4th of July. No problem. Um, I actually today was working at incorporating a lot of those into the plan, which is still back. That's that further revised version yeah. is still back on my computer. Okay. So I was literally working on it when I left for, to get into the traffic jam to come here from Boston. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can, we can make a lot of those changes. I guess I would just point out that um, where this plan is in the stage of its evolution is that it's been approved by FEMA. And that really is the brass ring, getting FEMA's approval. So we have to be a little bit careful about how many, how many further changes you make to the plan, because once they've approved the plan, you're actually not really supposed to make any further changes to it at that point. Um, in practice, we've had this happen before, though. I think some editorial changes, some formatting changes, some sure. corrections of like names and dates, and that kind of thing is fine. Just substantive changes to, you know, analysis or recommendations in the plan would be something that is, at this point, now that the plan's been approved, um, and I should maybe point out that the significance of getting FEMA's plan approved for you, it's, it's a five-year approval process, so you actually are renewing the original plan you had a few years ago. And during that five-year period, then, when you have an approved plan, FEMA will then make the town eligible for a series of FEMA mitigation grants. So it's a grant eligibility kind of incentive that they hold out for having a plan approved. Um, it's not a mandate. You don't, it's not one of these things you have to have one of these plans, but it's a good, it's a good practice to have for the town to assess its hazards. And it's a good, uh, grant eligibility is a good thing to have. So you, you know, over the course of the next five years, if something comes up, you want to apply for uh, FEMA grants, they will pay for drainage and other improvement projects if they've been shown to be a problem uh, up to 75% of the cost. So does, that, does that include payments a priori or is it after an event? This is mitigation. So I This is mitigation. It doesn't, if you've identified an area, and this plan actually does identify some areas yeah. from past experience that is a problematic area and there is a project that would mitigate that, you don't have to wait for the next storm. Um, <coughs> to say, okay, because you, you've already based your uh, analysis on past storms that have already happened or past events that have already happened. We hope that would be the answer. Yeah, that, yeah that, that's right. What's the interval to, on such grants from? Well, uh, there's, there's two kinds of grants that typically have been available through, for projects. One is an annual appropriation from Congress called the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant, or PDM. I, I love that word pre-disaster. It makes you sit on the edge of your seat. When's the disaster coming? Yeah, you, you can find the pre, the pre stock increase. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that has traditionally been appropriated as part of FEMA's national budget every year. Now, of course, priorities are changing in Washington, so we're not sure how that will fare, but it's been in place for many, many years. And many communities across the whole country rely on that grant program for you know, serious matters of mitigating hazards. So we're hoping that even with some of the shifting priorities in Washington that this program will still continue on. You said serious, so how big a number are serious pro projects? Uh, you know, the projects that get approved really can, there's a quite a wide range of dollar amounts. They can be a small project for 40 or 50,000, that would be on the small end. They can be way into the six figures uh, in some cases. The, the trick is that the cost that a project would would, uh, Im, Im, would put on the federal government, which is 75 percent, has to be justified by showing that there's an equivalent benefit. And so when you apply for the actual grant for a project, you have to do a, an analysis that shows a cost benefit. A lot of federal programs use that kind of an approach. They want to know that a federal dollar spent will save at least a dollar in avoided costs or damage. Uh, so it's a wide, a wide range of costs, and you know the bigger the, the bigger the cost of the grant, the bigger the lift is to sort of document what the benefit would be. An ROI calculation, the return on investment kind of a thing. Exactly. exactly. That's right. John, the, could I have one more thing? There's sure. a second grant I was going to say. Oh, That's the annual yeah. one. Yeah. Then there's the called PDM, pre disaster mitigation. The second grant is called Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. They, there's a lot of alphabet soup with HMGP, and also flood mitigation uh, assistance (FMA). The hazard mitigation grant program is episodically available only after an, a disaster, a national disaster is declared. So, for instance, I think the last one we had declared might have been the tornadoes that hit Western Mass, and then there was an ice storm before that, and then we had big flood. There were a few of them 
back with 2007 and 2010, big flood events. Every time a, a disaster reaches a threshold where it gets to be a declared disaster, in the, in the aftermath of that disaster, a certain amount of dollars are released to this hazard mitigation grant program. And the amount released is a formula that's based on a percentage of, of the uh, relief dollars that are paid out in damages for that event. Uh, and the way Massachusetts manages this, th these are federal dollars that then are managed in the state by the Mass Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, so our, our state counterpart, the FEMA. The way they manage that, if the disaster occurred in, let's say, Hampshire County, the, the tornado, they don't limit the eligible grantees to that county. Anyone who has a good project statewide, once that disaster is declared and the HMG grant is made available, they make it available statewide because they know that it's kind of a random when, it, when and where disasters occur, but we all, longer term we have needs in all parts of the state. So that you can't predict. It'll, the next, you know, right now there's not an HMD. We haven't had a declared disaster in a couple of years. Uh, it's, I call it the silver lining grant. It's like we get a disaster and then there's a grant that's made available. John? Yeah. Just as a curiosity, and we, I don't know if this information is available, Julie, or possibly you have it, but um, so this will be, I guess, the second mitigation plan. Our first one was five plus years ago. Right. Um, how many grants have we applied for and how much have we received? None and none. Oh. Okay. That's so good. that's a good value proposition <laughs> uh, so for us. What, Andrew? So uh, follow up to that question. Did, uh, having gone through this report, um, are there any, there, it seems like flooding was the number one issue. Which is common in most of the communities around here. And um, are there any projects around Reading? where it, it, may, it may be a good fit to apply for a FEMA grant for this, uh, the hazardous, uh, hazard mitigation grant program, where uh, the benefit the, may the place to start looking at are the, are the flood problem areas that the plan identifies to yeah. see if out of that, and the details of what kind of a project might be useful would come from your engineering and public works folks. They would have that kind of knowledge. But this plan is a good sort of priority list to say, here's where you look, here's point uh -huh. your attention in this direction. It's not to say that you couldn't have something else, but hopefully if there's a problem that was serious enough, it was, it was, it was, in, there. It was in there as identified on the list, right? So this is pre-planning to actually have an, an actual project proposal, but it, it definitely screens the possible areas and gives you some places to, to point your attention. Barry. Where, um, actually, a question merely for Bob. Wasn't there, we were dealing with an issue a couple of years ago with some um, beavers creating some flooding down by um, Walker's, Walker's Brook, Brook area. Yep. Um, it, that's not a disaster related issue, but it, would, would something like that fit into um, something that we can apply for the grant, a grant for? Uh, I, I guess I would say generically, because the beavers come up in almost every town <laughs> we work with. It's a common, common problem. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not exactly a disaster, but it could cause a flood. It, it, could, it could exacerbate a flood. If, then if you have high waters and a big rainstorm, instead of the flow going where it should naturally go, it may back up and that may flood people's basements or depending on what's nearby. So the answer to the question, usually those kinds of prob projects aren't really rise to the level of a FEMA grant. And the other problem, as probably folks know who's ever tried to deal with it, it's a highly regulated area to do anything about the beavers. You've got a lot of wildlife regulations that kind of you know, restrict how much you can do about that. Which is a frustrating situation for those that live near these areas. That Follow up on John's question, what steps would we need to undertake immediately if we wanted to take the Fairfield Avenue project, for example, and use that as a subject matter of a grant? Is that on us, town of Reading? Is it something MAPC helps with? The grant for an actual project would be the town. Uh, and you would, you would wait until the next time uh, a grant is made available is announced. Although if you really were serious about it, you might start doing some pre-planning for that to, to gin it up a little bit. Uh, but the next time that there is, the, we expect the next grant opportunity will be this next round of annual pre-disaster mitigation, barring having another storm that releases HMGP grants. We expect that to break. Uh, the problem is it's like asking the question about anything in Washington now. Uh, you know, all the, all the traditional rules and timing are kind of off out the window and it's, it's hard to know. But it's first in best stressed wins, I guess, right? It's not so much first in. I mean, there will be a grant, when the grant is, is made available, there will be a period of time. 
So, you know, put in your applications between this date okay. and that. Everyone who puts in their application in that window of time, you know, has an equal chance. It's more the merit of the project and that cost-benefit analysis. And how long is that window of application typically? It's usually about six or eight weeks. Is that enough time to draft such a draft a it, grant for That's us? why if you're serious about a project, it's probably good to start to do some preliminary work on it to start to get it a little more, you know, pre prepared for, for that because it can be a fairly quick and realistic uh, you, actual time period. Do you second. have an opinion as to the hit rate of such yes. applications? Or is it one in ten? If you just statistically, it's probably better than one in ten, but it's also not, you know, eighty, per, 80 or ninety percent of them do not get funded. It's not one in three, and it's better than yeah, one. It, it, they, it, it is a difficult grant application. Uh, it it really all comes down to the cost benefit for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, a few other things to think about because you're usually doing work in rivers, streams, floodplains, wetlands. That's a regulated area, so the work you might want to do would also need some permitting often through the Conservation Commission, through the Wetlands Act, or maybe some other water management permitting. So that's another sort of requirement that you sort of have to check off, besides having a cost benefit, is that if there is any permitting needed, you're not running up against uh, you know, a blind spot with that. And the third thing, it's probably not as common, but you have to sign off on whether the project you're proposing would have any impact on historic resources, so like on the National Register. And that, that won't happen in most cases, but say there was an old dam with an old mill or something, that could be entered into into the equation and in your experience where you've seen successful outcomes is it the type of project that drives it more than for example if it's a chronic issue that's going to be remediated versus say a, nu a nuisance issue yeah the chronic issue is going to have a higher chance of uh, okay. the greater the threat the greater the hazard the okay. and, and then the be and the more effective your proposed pr project would be at mitigating that hazard the better chance you'll have. The towns that have done a good job and kind of knocked off all the chronic ones are actually in second place on this one. It sounds like the ones that have chronic. In problems. a sense, if some other towns have already gotten the low hanging fruit right. in their own communities, Thanks. that's right. That, that's very possible. Okay. Bob? Um, just for the board, um, Julie and I can work on the fact that we have three large enough projects in the stormwater uh, enterprise fund to, to be planned as capital. There's 100,000 a year that deals with sort of the low hanging fruit. Right. Uh, but these three projects are large enough and they have flooded residents and businesses that we've deemed them worth putting in. And on, as we've discussed in the budget process, if we're going to do all of them at once, $40 a household is not going to hold anymore. Right. So looking at a grant for this would certainly make sense. To follow up on Bob's question, if, if you have town money, let's assume for the moment we have the revolving fund monies and we have, we're successful on a grant, I assume there's a color of money discussion where you can use these dollars over here, but only these dollars over here, and you got to keep it all straight. Uh, well, what there is, if you get a FEMA grant, it will pay for 75% of the cost of whatever the project is. You still have to pick up 25% yeah. oh, so from whatever, and they don't care what anyway. source you right. use for that 25, except that I think they, they yeah. might make a restriction on that other 25% being other federal dollars. Yeah. Uh, but if you have stormwater fund money or any yeah. just capital budgeting money that can meet that 25, that, that's what you need. Uh, you, can, you can always put in more than 25 if you think you can only get so much of a grant, right. and, yeah. but that's, that's the minimum. Um, so your opening comments were on the severity and magnitude of proposed changes. The ones I saw were largely formatting and appearance. They, they didn't necessarily change. Right. I think we can make most of those changes. I've already worked on, well, Sam Cleves worked on one round of changes yeah. based on the comments we got last week. Okay. Uh, and I literally got from Julie yesterday a, yeah, an additional list, and t today I was actually cranking through most of those. I was embarrassed to say, oh my goodness, I forgot to do this. No, and, uh, so I did it on Saturday. Um, any other comments, John? I, I have a, just a few questions. And, you know, I'd like to follow the bouncing ball of what this really is for a minute. Um, when, when is the last time that this granting window opened? Last, about a year ago. So May is this a... May of last year. So is this an annual thing or about an annual thing or it's whenever they get around to it? It's about an annual thing, but for some strange reason, it doesn't occur in the same time of year, the same month every single year. I think it really does depend on when Congress. First, Congress appropriates the money, and then it takes time for it to actually administratively funnel through the agencies. And, be, and, and it actually goes through two steps. It's federal money coming from FEMA, which FEMA turns over to the state, and then MEMA is actually the entity that puts the grant out in the streets and informs the towns, hey, there's a grant available. So, so the process really is two agencies that we'd be dealing with. You only have to deal with MEMA on the grant itself. Uh, in other words, MEMA does is the front-facing agency to the communities. If you were going to apply for a project grant, you would be sending it to MEMA. 
MEMA in turn would be packaging everything they get in the whole Commonwealth and giving that to FEMA. They're not the ultimately decision maker. No, they're not. But they would they would screen projects and by by FEMA's criteria. Uh, and let you know, you know, that's just not going to fly or you need to, they'll actually kind of be in your corner. They'll often say, you know, make these changes before we submit it, it'll do better, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, so to, to continue the, the questions I have about this, everything I've listened to so far over the last two meetings indicates to me that this is a insurance policy that we're buying because we're spending money on this. This is something that we're paying money for. And furthermore, um, it sounds like at the local level we have been doing our own planning around yeah. areas that are you yeah. know troubled exactly. areas that we know are troubled areas that we we address capital issues when capital is available. It's not as though we're unaware of these issues, and that's being done on a local level, and that's part and parcel of what our staff does, and you know the team that's on board. So. Back to my point about this. So we spend a premium every five years on an insurance policy that we may or may not ever be able to use, which I understand is how insurance policies work. Um, but I just want to be clear in my own understanding of the, of the cost-benefit analysis of what we're really doing here. Um, we're doing, we're spending, now I'm going to guess $25,000 on the consulting work from MAPC. I'm guessing we spent that once before or some number similar to that. Um, our own input is looked at but really can't be fully embraced because there's a federal agency that says what this has to look like and, and I kind of get that too. So, um, so I, I guess the question becomes for me, um, in five years, five plus years, we've never applied. Um, and there are considerable hoops at two different levels once you do apply to, to win a grant. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, it, there's some number between 20% and some other percent that says you've got a shot at this. Um, and so this really is putting us in the club of what may happen someday somehow and maybe we get something. You know, from the pure standpoint of mitigating these kinds of issues, it sounds like our local team is on the case. Yeah, this yeah. doesn't help any of the act work we do. It might help finance some of the work, and it's probably less of a insurance policy and more of a lottery. You just bought a lottery. Uh, it, yeah, it's more of a lottery than an insurance policy. I agree with it that, John. It pay off, but it likely won't. So <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, and this is a sunk cost. Yeah. It is. We've spent this money, okay? Right. Whether it was a good value or bad value, I'm not here to judge, and nor do I want to opine on that. Uh, I'm glad that you guys were very responsive to some of the issues that we had are really up through today. So I really appreciate that. Um, and our work with MAPC over an extended period of time over the last number of years has been exceptional. So this isn't a question in that area. I just say out loud that when this comes up the next time, let's get in front of it instead of behind it and make a value judgment of how we're spending our money. Now, that's all. That's very fair to say. I guess I would only add to that uh, whether you want to think. I think I've always thought of these plans as having two benefits for the community. One is, is the, you know, the right to get into the lottery or the insurance pool. Yeah. The other is the intrinsic value of really taking stock from A to Z of all of your hazards figuring out what you're already doing, where the gaps are. It's a planning process, so which yeah. hopefully has its own, some entry. Now, for a town that's further ahead along already, it sounds like Reading is, maybe the incremental improvement that that gives you compared to other towns isn't as much, but I still think it has that in inherent value, getting it all down in one place, giving you a, a blueprint for where you want to go. <laughs> and the only thing I'll add is that what you're talking about, how you're already looking at capital programs, that's exactly what these plans are intended to do, to not just be a plan, but to take the pieces that are in this plan over time, over the five years, and integrate them into your capital planning, your public works It's planning, a mapping strategy. Right, and all of that. It's kind of lays a blueprint out for you. Yeah. yeah. So, and I do appreciate those comments, and I'm not suggesting that I would vote against this because I'm not. I'm going to vote in favor of getting it done because we've spent the money and, and here we are, and we're in the lottery. 
Um, so that's great. I'm just saying out loud so that maybe we would have some institutional memory that let's be in, let's be a little further in front of this and you know and make a value judgment going forward and let's be aggressive um, about uh, how many times we enter the lottery when we have good cause to do so. Um, I'm very receptive to that line of thinking. Um, many of us in this building are from the private sector, so we have a little bit of a different take. Uh, when I first got here, one of the first things I did was to stop sending out uh, tax bills and uh, personal property tax bills for things that cost more than the stamp. Right. <laughs> of course. And I, I've met with resistance. Benefit, right? <laughs> I, well, you, we've had this discussion. So yeah. I totally understand that line of thinking. Um, another thing we've stopped in the last few years, as, as with me as town manager, is we don't apply for $1,000 grants that cost us $500 to apply for. It makes right? no it's sense. Just, it's just not sensible. Right. So we're a lot more careful. We're not looking to win. We're not looking to win the $1,000 and right. say victory. We're looking at the real economic. Yeah, it's something that's going to really have an impact. And this is not, my comments shouldn't be, right. no, I, I totally shouldn't be it. interpreted as being negative, because they're not. See if, it's, if, it's just uh, thinking about the analytics. It's kind of, right, un unfortunately, that's the way my brain is. You know, as an operations guy, that there are people who look at your cost and my cost of wages as a sunk cost. You're free. So let's go get that thousand dollars. <laughs> you and I don't look at it that way. You're right. You have an opportunity cost. cost to do it yeah. with that yeah. time. You can spend right. it somewhere else. John. Yes. Andy. So Bob has an, uh, has outlined a number of projects, flood control projects already that are 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 not cheap, yeah. and would be worth getting. Would you say seventy five percent funding on? And <clears> since we've already gone through the process, you know, with the lottery, you can't win if you you don't play. Yeah. I spent right. maybe nine years in academia, and a one in ten shot for a grant is is pretty damn good. Um, so, so FEMA actually has a flood mitigation assistance grant program that opens the application period is from August 14th through November 17th, 2017. So maybe if the projects that we already have in the pipeline, um, obviously you're right. If it's a ton of work to do, and it's just not going to be worth the. Benefit it, it could have been work we've already done, though, so right. it's worth our while to look. I mean, if you have property damages from previous yeah. floods that you could drum up some number for, yeah. just, just a thought, and they give information on how you apply to the grants. Yeah. That's a good idea, though, Andrew. Is there a chance, is any of this reimbursement where you've already spent the money, the projects? No, they won't reimburse for money you've already spent. I see. You, you, you have to, it has to be a project that you spend money on after they've approved yeah. the grant. You can't do the, you yeah, can't do the right thing and fix it and get deal with it later. <laughs> right. I, see. I know it's in terms it's, of the game. A lot of things about this. Ready, yeah, exactly. fire, aim. Right. You have to have the projects <laughs> on the shelf ready to go. I just uh, ask a question. How does this process compare to uh, a disaster declared on a snow emergency? So, um, we've been through six appraisers with FEMA since the two year ago snowstorm and are just about ready to finish it up. So, you know, FEMA by no means makes this easy. And I'm just curious, is that kind of disaster money a different funnel it's completely? It's a different funnel completely. Okay. Not that it is any easier necessarily, right. but okay. it's a different track altogether. Our fire chief does that. These what days. you're looking at, well, you just mentioned about if you could show the costs that have been in that's the whole trick of the cost yep. benefit, to be able to document those costs. And that yep. can be hard because how are they documented? Uh, it, sometimes, you know, individual homeowners have damages. If they haven't made a formal claim, um, it's hard to know. So uh, that's okay. the tricky part of, of coming up with the cost benefit. Yeah, Julie, Julie, Julie couldn't agree with you more, by the way. Bob, uh, question for you. Do you have any idea, and this probably runs at least two orders of magnitude range, but what would a typical effort to create such a grant likely be? Is it 40 hours or 400 hours? Probably more typically 40, but it really depends on the grant. Um, I'm more familiar with the federal grant for ARCASA. That's on the bigger side. Yeah. Um, I would think 40 hours on a grant is a big grant. It's a big it's a one. decent amount of time. Yeah. The ones that look like what you said down here, they're not FEMA grants, but yeah. there's a lot less time on that. Um, but maybe Martin has an idea? We haven't worked with towns on the individual grants, so okay. I really couldn't give you a number on that. But um, it, it, a lot really comes back to that cost-benefit analysis and how long it takes you to pull together the information. Yeah. Do, do they look kindly on mathematical uh, cost-benefit analyses, such as the probability of an incident, the, the magnitude of the consequence? They actually have 
a, uh, a form, not a formula, but a process that you have to use. You have to use their, I see. and they'll lead you through it. They, they, they even occasionally offer trainings in how to, mm -hmm. how to do their cross-benefit process. Uh, so, yeah, you, don't, you can't get too creative with your own methodology. Right. Yeah, they're very formulaic on snow yeah. and ice. Okay, it's pretty Equipment. nice. They, they lead you. This. Yeah. It's all in line. You just go step by step. Just send us the money. It's much easier. <laughs> 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 Trust us. All right. Any other questions from the board? If not, I, uh, we're looking for a vote tonight to accept. The actual language should be to adopt. That's the, the term that we use to adopt the plan. We don't clear it. another. Just a second. Keep going. Oh. Can we get that done, given that there's some amendments that he's working on? Just ask him. I mean, you. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I think I it's mean, fine. I, I mean, I know what they are. They're, yeah, I'm fine with them as well. Um, so this is just a signature. This is not a. Is this a motion? No. That's what we're reading. Just adopt yes. the hazard mitigation plan as presented. Yes. That's that's what that's the resolution you are adopting. It, it should okay. be. Do you want me to read? It was the in the plan. Um, I actually, I just think I make. I'll make the motion to adopt the uh, Reading Hazard Mitigation Plan as um, revised um, this evening. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. And, and you'll. Four zero. Or zero, excuse me, thank you. Um, you'll have the updates, most recent ones in by end of the week? Oh, okay, yes. Very good. Where we, where we can, there are a few places where we don't want to overturn FEMAs, but all of the formatting, all of the right. updated correct information, that sort of thing. All right, good. Thank you very much for coming in. Julie, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, thank you. Do we need to sign this, or we'll just do this later? Someone will have to have sign that it's like I have a good version. She's got the real version. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, Next, we're going to move to uh, discussion and approval chair. of the. Um, I'm guessing the chair. <laughs> Fiscal 18 Board of Selectmen meeting schedule. Bob, do you have a presentation? I do. Um, well, not really a presentation. You got. Um, you guys met with FinCom last week, so you're, a, you know, half of a leg up on me. Um, the discussion that um, we had with FinCom, we've had previously. Uh, previously, John has had with the school committee was basically to move the budget process up uh, faster. So let me just find. Is that, in our, is that thing in our real page? It is in our packet. Um, no, no. Show me the packet. It looks like this, the thing behind me, is five pages. Honestly, I don't remember in your packet where it was. I think it's, yeah. You can follow along behind it, uh, this. Yeah, it's not in order. I remember seeing that in the packet, but that doesn't mean it's hidden in there somewhere. I think it's out of order, but it's there. Okay. Um, as, as, as far as I understand it now, John uh, Doherty and I had breakfast, so there's a slight change to this, but this is a generally accepted um, schedule for the budget process by the FinCom, the school committee, and now I'm passing it by you formally. It begins in September with a financial form and concludes, if you will, for a financial form in October. Those are more typically October, November, so those are each advanced by a month. Um, there's only so much that can happen at a September financial forum uh, because it's very likely that the town accountant has not closed the year yet. She still, or, she, or if she has, that the DOR has not signed off on the closed year. So we will only have a rough idea of free cash. We'll have her estimate if she's willing to say. Um, you know, you recall from last year that uh, we used over $2 million in free cash for the high school litigation, so it's unlikely that free cash goes up this year. Um, on the uh, October financial form, we will have free cash, but I think the default assumption for all of us is use a million dollars annually to balance budgets. That's something we've more or less come to agree that it's regenerated. So it doesn't matter what free cash is in that scenario. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's any significant financial articles on the warrant for November. Uh, I am aware of some positive developments internal to the capital budget. Um, the fire chief has applied for and received a pretty significant uh, FEMA grant for equipment. 
details are still to be worked out, but that's going to save over $100,000 in the capital plan. Right. So there'll be a couple of good um, amendments. This is the point Greg to do all FEMA stuff. Well, he wins all the time. He does. He's very persistent. Um, in October and November, then town and school staffs will then be devising a balanced budget. In December, the selectmen will begin and conclude their public uh, budget process that normally takes the month of January. The schools will begin in December but not conclude until the middle of January. They're normally going right up to February 1st. Um, what John said to me today is he may add one more meeting within this time frame and the 18th would still be the last one um, if he doesn't have enough time. <clears throat> one of the things I'm going to discuss Thursday with the department heads and with John Doherty is um, <coughs> We've set you up for four budget meetings. T typically, that's more than you usually get. From what my understanding of what FinCom told you uh, last week was they plan to attend as a board uh, to your meetings and the schools as much as possible. Not just liaisons, but full attendance if possible. Yeah. So we'll need a different site. What's that? Need a different site, bro. Yes, I think so. Probably a library or some larger venue. Uh, that being the case, I like the four meetings because they're gonna, you're going to want to have more detail out of department heads. It's so much more valuable to have a department head talk than me. I mean, there's just no getting around that. And if everyone hears it once, then the department head doesn't have to repeat it for the FinCon. Yeah, that's normally what happens. They'll come in here, and then, and then in March they're doing it again. It's just, I mean, it's great because... It's and John has the same issue where he, you know, he spends an hour... His first hour with FinCom is making a presentation that he's already made. Well, we had three last year, and they were really productive. Yeah. And I think having everybody in the room you know, is just better because you hear it. Instead of, you know, something always seems to get lost when you do it again and again. You know. And, and I, I know. It makes more productive because you don't have to repeat. Yeah. Uh, what, what's value to me, and I don't know what's value to you, is when someone like Jane Burns comes in and tells a story, that's the value that I see. Absolutely. That, you don't see that in a budget book. She's yeah. telling you, talking about people, about how the real impact of the staff works. How the program's impacted. Well, the right questions get asked, too. Yeah. And, you know, if you have everybody in the room, you get the benefit of that discussion rather than just the book. And to that point, to the degree all that, I assume all that's all televised on RCTV. Yes. That gets played to the voter public. That's going to, I think also pay dividends in terms of comprehension and intimacy with the data and the process. So I, I think that's great that everyone's willing to sign up for these, these joint sessions. Yeah, and, and the school department, I can't speak for the school committee yet, but the school department and the towns fully understand, um, you know, we need to create and produce a, ba a balanced budget to the million dollars of free cash and whatever revenues available. So that's what the superintendent's budget will be. That's what the town manager's budget will be. Good. We hope that that's what the school committee's budget will be. But again, they can they have to speak <coughs> for themselves. Well, isn't the, pro I mean, the process as we laid it out is to um, produce a balanced budget and then addendum A, or if the community grants us more revenue, um, we will add the following line items back into the budget. So right. I, I would Zoom the school committee. I mean, there's just one budget that comes out of there, and, right. and then and all the all the sort of other things become part of the addendum, and that's what we've been asking. Yeah. yeah, but I will say, and I'm, it's not a criticism; it's just a fact that more often than not, the school committee's budget is not balanced in most recent years. And that going back ten years, I'd say seven out of ten years is not balanced. And that's because they believe they have a moral obligation to let everyone know what it really costs to run the school department at the minimal level that they're willing to accept, which is more than what the funding is. They're going to still have the same issue this year, guaranteed. The question is, you know, and, and hopefully you're right, because there's a clear understanding, and they were at your meeting with FinCom as well, they understand that the outlet for that, if you will, is a list and so, s serves as a you know, baseline for an override. So, but it's still worth saying all these things out loud just to make sure yeah, yeah. we've all said it. Still have six months to forget it. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the schools will then have um, more budget meetings than normal, and they'll also they're going to rearrange the order they typically do it in. And again, expect to have more participation from FinCom as a group, and, and certainly the selectmen are welcome. Right. We talked about attending, right, Barry? Yeah. We talked about attending those meetings. So well. yeah, we may post the board. The school committee may be posted for yours. The more, the merrier. And I agree, a good, a bigger venue is, is um, very important. 
Uh, before you shoot yep. um, off of January, what we had discussed at the FinCom meeting uh, last week was that um, with the Munis budget in place, followed by the school budget voted on on the 18th, and then a financial forum on the 24th, that all the, uh, as much specificity as we could get for an override number would be in place, and we had uh, uh, bantered about the idea of voting a override number on the 30th, although it was there was some confusion whether it was the 30th or the 31st, where it was the Tuesday. But I think it came out as a Tuesday, and the idea was that um, it would allow us more time to inform the community about what the override would be spent on. Yeah, um, the, the one part of the discussion, and I've talked to Barry a little bit since, and, and John a little bit since, that I was not clear on is what is the purpose of January 24? But as I understand it, that financial form, you know, it, sometimes it's listed and optional, mm. and sometimes we don't bother. Um, I think what it can do this year is you've got all the balanced budgets, you've got all the ad lists, and you can call for an override that night. I don't see why you wouldn't. If that's what you want to do. You've so got all the information. So when you say call for the override, does it mean that, okay, folks, on April 3rd, we will have an override vote on the ballot amount TBD? No, I would specify that. I have to specify the number. Yeah. So that means there has to be, you know, chair, vice chair discussions or whatever is necessary for the schools to, you know, assuming they prioritize the list, it's up to you, if you will, where to draw the line for both sides. That's right. your job. But obviously it can be a mutual discussion. And it can be a discussion on the night of the 24th. And maybe a discussion on the 24th. And, you know, and at the end of the night, you know, and, you know if you yeah. feel comfortable that you've solved the problem and there's agreement or whatever, you guys, you five are comfortable, do it right then. My, my 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 recollection was that um, the 24th we would have public input and allow for a lot of public input input and then at our the following Tuesday meet and deliberate amongst ourselves and vote Do that but too. I, I I don't you know I guess it could, could work either way last year when we did this um, you might remember maybe not you Andrew but um, yeah. we went through the the town's prioritized list and the school's prioritized list, we did have to draw a line. And yes. It was somewhat lower than both groups wanted. This year, that effort's going to be even more challenging. One, um, we know what the voters' view was last year. Two, we're another year behind. We're another year behind, so the yeah. hole's gotten deeper. So yeah. I think the hand wringing is even going to be greater mm -hmm. this year. So doing that on the 24th probably yeah. will in my mind, benefit from a night's sleep and yeah. another meeting before we take it up. I, yeah. I don't think you lose any immediacy with the public. I think all the yeah. facts are on, this, on the table. The, yeah. the pros and cons are all going to be evident. Right. Uh, RCTV will be there. There was a 50% reduction last year yeah. in that's the number I, that was suggested to us, if you'll remember. I mean, I think that's why we sort of talked about I think I might have said, well, why can't we do it on the 24th? And mm -hmm. You and Barry might have said, well, maybe that let's look for the next week so we can have maybe not time to sleep on it, but a little time to deliberate. That would still give us ample time to generate the rationale for this, uh, more so than what we had in October. If folks have been watching, and I assume they will, they'll have all of the December and January meetings. A lot of comprehension should be distributed at that point. There is, shouldn't be any surprises that come out of a discussion that happens in February, the first Tuesday in February. I think it'll, all, all, this, all the uh, ingredients that go into the decision making and all the baseline budgets and all of the um, expected punch list and parties list will all be evident to folks. So the only thing different, the only thing left was would you snap the line, and that can be the discussion on the first meeting of February, or or, or on the thirtieth, uh, or on the thirtieth. Yeah. 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 Is that the date? A, currently, we don't have a. Uh, meeting scheduled for the 30th which is why I brought it up at least not on not that I could see we have it's a like a January 23rd is January a meeting no, uh, February 13th right so we had talked about at the FinCom that. meeting having a meeting on the 30th uh, almost a week after the financial forum to then vote in override number 
Yeah, none of those meeting dates are set in stone. The only thing to be careful of is this one here. February 27th yeah, is yeah, your yeah. deadline, and I would really wish you would do it sooner so we had a snow you know, yeah. week. But if we take the vote earlier on, on that, then well, that we can close the warrant on other things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, Barry? So, so Bob, did, have you had any talks with talk with uh, the chairman of the FinCom? I have not talked to FinCom since that. Because on, on, the, on the schedule, you know, what it does is that potentially we are, um, we're going out and saying, you know, we're going to be asking for an override of X amount of dollars. We're going to do that on the 24th or the 30th of February 1, and that's before FinCom meet, does its meeting. So, you know, does that kind of make FinCom's meetings sort of more you know, kind of rote, and you know, they're sort of more... Well, yeah, without yeah. being disrespectful, I'd say right. yes, because they've already participated much more in the process, um, but they feel that they now have to have some kind of budget process in February. Right. Um, this is what I outlined to them. Whatever they want to do is fine, um, but they do need to vote budgets somehow. Yeah. But the budgets yeah. that are going to be voted... The baseline budget. Yes. They're not going to be really tied to any override well because you, that's unpredictable that, um, Sharon and um, Gail Dowd and I talked about that a little today it would probably be a good idea to for FinCom to have voted if you will two budgets because if an override is brought in the first week of April and passes then town meeting will be asked to vote a different budget than they're going to be looking at they're going to see a budget and then they're going to have information that's the prioritized list which can guide them through instead of line M1 now being a million, it's a million one. So, it, you know, FinCom's going to have to uh, vote and approve that budget before town meeting does, anyways. The they amended can, budget? Or yes. No, why, why would FinCom? They have to approve a budget that well, they can't go to in front of the town meeting. meeting of, a budget. Uh, which, oh, sorry. They don't technically have to according to the charter, but it's certainly good practice for them to have agreed to a new budget. The town meeting is so then, then being shown. So then those meetings are? Fruitful and productive. So, yeah, they are. Yeah. Okay. And the question is whether you have FinCom vote at the end of these meetings, both budgets, if you will, or whether you wait until after an override, because uh, again, well, they have to meet and they have to vote. So the, the, the time, between the time the override vote happens and the first town meeting? Have them yes. Vote? But we that. can't direct, I mean, we're not They'll in a position to direct gonna anybody gonna do to do, do anything no, I think that they're outside of our purview. Right. But they're. You know, what was clear from, from when we all met last time was that, you know, everybody realizes that this is a different year, a different process, and, and I don't think anybody's being, you know, saying, well, this is the way we do it. We have, I, think, I think we're all trying to work toward a schedule that gets us to, to you know, where we need to be. So, um, I guess one of the questions to have, if you think about sort of who has what authority and the process, Income is bottom line authority in the schools, but there's more authority on town. What if John and I each present a list of prioritized, you cut, you draw the line and you agree with it, but then FinCom doesn't agree with the town specific details. You say, instead of that, we want that. They need to have an opportunity to have that discussion in public and then vote it that way. That's all I'm saying. But that could happen after the override passes. It, it, well, it should Probably happen, the should. discussion should happen in February. But absolutely, the actual final decision could wait. So you should slot another FinCon meeting somewhere in well, April? Oh, okay. they, they need one in March to vote Warren articles in any event, because there's no way Warren articles are going to be ready before you close the warrant. Uh, well, this won't be enough detail. Sorry. Um, so it's yeah, quite possible FinCon may have to meet in April between, after a vote and between the 3rd and the 23rd. Which is no big deal. Yeah, they could do that. Yeah. So that would say that they would their principal vote in February would be on the base budget. They would have seen the prioritized list and where the line got snapped. They would know what the Board of Selectmen called for in terms of an override dollar amount, but their, their horizon and focus is just on the baseline until after the 3rd of April, whereupon they talk about the incremental pieces. That actually simplicates it for them because all they're worried about is the baseline budget, which is not in debate. Both schools and town, in theory, are equally just uncomfortable with what's in the baseline budget. And really, the, what makes the budget palatable is is the, are the addendums that the voters Correct. may or may not Correct. agree with. So, yeah. yeah, that's unusual, Bob. We don't do this often. We don't do this discussion often. Is that got any pitfalls you see with breaking it up that way? I'm sure there will be, but I haven't thought of them yet. 
You know, I haven't had a conversation with FinCom, so it's really hard to know what their appetite. I just watched. I'm interested their in their view on this because I, I wouldn't want to do something that's um, one that we haven't thought through and two that right. they have an objection to. As I was concerned when I first sort of saw something like this, that you know, and, and Barry's comments were, "Well, the selectmen really need to call for an override sooner than the end of February." It's like, okay, well, you don't want to render to FinCom's discussions in fe what, February what as moot. Right. But you can't move them up into, into January because the schools can't hit that deadline. So, you know, that was kind of the thought process and the discussion. I think this is okay, but there is a little bit of friction there. Okay. Any discussions, Andrew? Um, fr from, from the feedback that I got, and we have FinCom's liaison here, uh, from the feedback that, that I, at least what I heard from the FinCom folks was that this process was okay. Did you guys get a different feel for no, that? No, but I think they wanted to sleep on it. I, you know, maybe they feel differently today. Vanessa? Vanessa Alvarado, Grand Street, um, I'm a committee member. Uh, so at the discussion that we had on Jan June 29th uh, regarding the meeting, there were going to be two purposes for the meeting in February. Um, one was to open up the discussion to allow for additional financial forums to answer any questions town residents may have to help inform on what the override would be used for. Um, my concern is that January 30th date, uh, because FinCom is in an awkward situation where we can vote on that bottom line number, but we can't address anything that will be restored if we don't have that number. So the, 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 the Board of Selectmen portion can happen for the January 30th, and then FinCom continues on to February with the vote. And there was no issue raised here at the Finance Committee meeting. So this, uh, the January 30th date, I think, is the important one to add to the calendar, but February is fine as it stands now. And, and, and normally, too, you know, just from my years on FinCom, uh, the FinCom budget me meetings were essentially bringing in the department heads yeah. and the schools. Which um, is already done. Which, th which FinCom will have been participating yeah. in the early parts of the meeting. And, and there were, yeah, obviously, there were there's different questions and different takes. and. Um, different angles of looking at things, but but by and large, it was similar presentations to what had happened at the select and the school committee. And so, well, also um, bear in mind, and this has evolved a little over time, but when the budgets are shown to the selectmen, uh, if you will, it's a draft budget, looking for some advice in certain areas. We can discuss that again as to how much draft you really want, as opposed to something a little more. Maybe we can have the draft discussion before December, but th that's. The January budget meetings you had were genuinely looking for your input on some things before a budget was stamped as okay. This is the town manager. Okay. My understanding also, so last year FinCom attended many meetings throughout December, January, February, um, both for the town and the school side. So by the time we reached those February or March meetings, as it were, we were already quite well versed in what was happening in the specifics of the budget um, from the meeting that. We So we'll be attending the school committee meetings as well. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll post. You know, obviously, we got our own private schedules. But my intention is to make as many of these as I can. Okay. I mean, because it's just good to know if we if if these are you know not in concrete but a plan. That's you know it's good to have that kind of advance yeah, notice. And I consider them in concrete. You know, we may think of a pitfall, and I'll let you know. But well, you have to have some flexibility, of course. But yeah. you know, any other comments, questions from the board? Yes. So uh, are the, the, the schedule as it stands now currently like the school committee budget meeting, um, is the schedule going to be uh, edited so that the FinCom and Board of Selectmen are posted simultaneously with this so that, uh, so that residents, when they look at the schedule, understand that all three boards of PCCs will be in attendance? <coughs> we could put a call. they might be wondering, right. one of the questions that came up last year was, um, when you're voting awfully quickly on this, um, how we haven't seen any discussion. So if we post demonstrating that we're all in attendance, it might make it more visible. That's a good we're point. This. So, so in addition to FinCom, then in December, 
will we be expecting and inviting the school committee to join us in quorum or be posted at least? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the best way to address Vanessa's point, which is an interesting one, is to sort of rename these as. Um, Almost like mini financial forums, but yes, yeah, give it some name call it financial budget meeting dash schools or dash town, depending on who's driving on that driving meeting. That day. Right, so in December, schools we're going to be uh, and we're in a way game. Uh, and I don't, we have not discussed, John and I have not discussed uh, locations yet, but it'd be awfully nice if we always had all the meetings in one place so everyone would I can see that being confusing. Yeah. What do you mean you moved? Thank you, Vanessa. That's all good inputs. Thanks. So, uh, just to clarify, are we in fact adding the January 30th date to the calendar? I, well, that's a selectman's meeting, so I, I'm not sure. It'll either be this. It'll either be that week or the week following. But it'll be. I think we need to add it. Oh, I, I believe we absolutely have to add it. But I don't. I think that you know, the sooner the better. I like the 30th. Personally, is that, is that the Tuesday? But we couldn't agree on what the Tuesday was. The Tuesday. The 30th. Is January. The 30th is well, we just add it on, and uh, you know, some obviously as we go forward, we just move your 23rd schedule. out to the 30th. Yeah. It's not or, a big deal. You know, or, yeah. or we keep I'm it okay because the stuff, other stuff we're doing. Hey, another meeting, given the gravity of what's going on, no, is, not a, is not onerous no, and no, it's probably no. appropriate. Right. No, and given that you're going to be posted and likely available to so many meetings, you do have other business. <laughs> do? You know, you can spend the last half hour on a different topic if you need to. Okay. I'm not a problem. I decompress the uh, Tuesday meetings, get some work done. Some other work done, I should say. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and add the 30th and move okay. and yeah. out the 23rd. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, we're slightly behind schedule here. 7.45 is what time it's supposed to be. And uh, I'm sorry, we'll move on to the... Uh, to the Reading Week, Wakefield. Yeah, the sale of real estate, Reading and Wakefield. This is an interesting one. Yeah. This is an interesting one. Um, this is an area I've driven for many years and always thought as I drove down Brook Street, which is a Reading name, that Reading was on the left and Wakefield was on the right, but that's not correct. Um, it's off the map, but Ash Street is right up here, which changes name when it goes into Wakefield. But these homes here on the right-hand side are actually in Wakefield. This house right here, we, have a, we own their front yard. This is the property in question, and we own the tiniest fraction of a front yard, and I'll show you photos. So this is the parcel. Wakefield owns this back section. Reading owns this front section. And interestingly, Wakefield gives it an address that doesn't really exist because Brook Street is in Reading. So they make up a, Re a Wakefield Street as if that were. So the front what door is. is on Brook Street. It is. Even though the front door is technically Wakefield. Correct. So it's an unusual circumstance. But after talking to uh, Steve Mayo about this, you know, for us to give him that land, would be way more complicated than any other process. It would take, you know, Beacon Hill would have to adjourn and start changing boundaries, and they're like, no, just don't do that. Um, let me just show you a couple pictures so you get a picture of what this is. Yeah, it's in our packet. That's really all you need to see. It's over Again, I had driven past this property for years and not realized there was something behind the trees because it's a little set back off the road. Um, the right-hand side here is actually the driveway, and there's some pretty nice-looking trees that have grown up in the driveway. Wow. So the thing I haven't added, but I know you've seen it in the memo, is both Wakefield and Reading hold this in tax title uh, and have for, for many years. Um, Wakefield has it assessed at a, certainly a higher value than Reading because there's a house on it. We have it assessed as $100. Um, Wakefield has offered to market the property, sell both pieces publicly through a process, and split the proceeds by square footage of the land, which is very generous of them. But then in terms of taxes, we do share the same assessor, so it was an interesting discussion we had. It's totally up to him how he assesses value. And he is unlikely to change his current methodology because the Reading parcel alone is not worth that much. So it's not going to be 35% of the total value of the lot, even though that might be what the sale price is, just so you know. So it's, it might be a one-time 50 or 100 grand in the sale of real estate fund and otherwise it's just putting something useful back into and neither, neither one of us have gotten many complaints from abutters on this property it's not board of health problem level from walking around you don't know what it's inside uh, it's just uncared for and for many years 
Are you suggesting that if Wakefield goes in and then markets this, that our share could be a hundred thousand? Um, what's a lot worth? A couple hundred thousand, maybe. It's the front yard in this one, but I don't know. You know where I don't know. I don't know the square footage. Well, one would think this lot is not worth that, but we only own like a sliver of it. It's like a third. But the it's home, I mean, it's, it's the it's the entirety of the property with the home on it and everything else. It's a very it's small parcel. Buy that. Although our part's small, the rest of it isn't, is very small as well. So you're not looking for a vote. This is just advice. No, this is just for your information. Yeah. This is a little hard to read, but I just wanted to show you. That's There's our assessed value, $100. Um, you know, we don't technically need your approval, but since this will be a public process with a neighbor, I thought you definitely should see it. All right, thank you. Public meeting. And I know um, there's been someone that I think is here tonight that's expressed some interest in it. So. Any public comment? Anyone would like to speak? I did just have one question because I did reach out to Steve Ann, but I am interested in it. Could you just uh, stand and let us oh, know your name? For this folks watching at home, so. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just had a question about the tax taking process. So they, we feel so they finished it there, and they need it ready to finish it in order for it to be put out for public bid. Right. Actually, just just tell us who you are, your name, where you oh, live. I'm Okay. I grew up in Wakefield. What street do you live on? Right now I live right on Highlands. Thank you. Um, you know, after tonight, we can then I'll sit down with Steve. I'm seeing him next week. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll figure out a timetable. Reading, we're, we're, we're going through a, a period where we're changing treasurer, which is the only thing that gives me a little hesitation. Our new treasurer starts in a week and a half. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do anything until we have a new treasurer. But after that, I'm fine with advertising the property and, and sailing. As far as we know, everything is fine in tax title. Everything is clear. Okay. So the, tr the treasurer is the person who has the legal authority to sell it in Reading. Oh, okay. Um, this was sort of a formality. In Wakefield, it's a little different. Their rules are a little bit different. Okay. Did the same thing, but it meant something slightly different in Wakefield. Oh, okay. So he needed more permission, if you will. Our treasurer has that permission. Okay. But again, the position is vacant for 10 days, so I just wanted to wait. Okay. Um, I would think that um, it's something that go on the market, I'll just, let's just say August. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Barry? Yeah. So Bob, so Wakefield is going to take the lead in sort of doing the marketing of it. Um, yeah. Is there any public hearing process for Wakefield? If it, if it, I mean, if it were us, no. would we be required to do any kind they, of public They had hearing? their public hearing in a selectman's meeting, if you will. That That was a requirement that they had in their charter. We don't have that. So this sort of access. I guess the only thing that I would have you know, kind of hope to see or encourage to see if it's still possible is that if there is any kind of public in input about sort of what the, what it's used for, that even though Wakefield, you know, sort of running that, it does have an impact on residents who are but in Reading, that there at least is some kind of notification or, or hearing, or do you know if in fact Reading residents were uh, the notified? The neighborhood was definitely notified, both towns were notified. I don't have any feedback on who attended. Um, you know, these are all Wakefield homes down here, Wakefield. So technically, except for across the street, they're Wakefield abutters, if you will, for what that's worth. Oh, so but I know both that sides. Line going line. this way is not the town. Is not the line. The line going north, northeast. This, this line serves. Line. It's close to where the actual border is, right here. This one. Mm -hmm. So that's a Reading home. That's a Reading home. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think technically the whole home is in Wakefield, even though it looks like it cuts it off here. Um, so close enough. We could have a swimming pool half in Reading and half in Wakefield. Yeah. yeah this at, least, at least it's not a state border. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so this would be a bidding process to, yeah. to seal bids over a period? I don't know, honestly. If we haven't discussed that, I, whatever Victor thinks is, is fine. I know there's a we have to follow public procurement disposition, same thing. Um, this is different than anything we would do through town meeting because it's tax title, and the treasurer has, if you will, town authority. meeting board of selectmen's authority. Now, I will tell you with a new treasurer, one of the things we're going to do is fix the tax title process a little bit and, and reg regiment it. Um, we would take properties and tax title whenever there was time, the treasurer had time, and she wouldn't always tell anyone. So you could see the condition of the property. And Wakefield felt the same way. They were embarrassed when we actually went out there one day and looked at it and said, well, been done much sooner. it should have been done three years ago. Okay. Any other questions? Andy? Yeah, John. Uh, comment and a quick question. Um, this this sort of bizarre setup between town boundaries happens more than you would think in New England for, I'm sure, reasons long since forgotten. 
Um, regarding the abutters and what's going to be done with the property, is it zone residential? Yep. So it's going to be a residence no yeah, matter. It's clearly non-conforming. It's a very small lot. Right. Um, it's going to have to be essentially what it is. And whether the house is structurally sound, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be a similarly sized house. Could add a floor. Okay. Who's going to buy this one? Okay, any other questions? Any other public comment? Thank you very much for coming in. Okay, we're going to move on now to the uh, town manager's fiscal 17 goals. We're on page um, 176 in tonight's packet. Um, I'll just step you through these quickly. I, th I think I had put this in your packet a couple weeks ago just so you get a preview. I mean, we did pretty well on our goals this year, um, for what that's worth. Um, most of the goals, I didn't count them, but most of them were completely accomplished. Certainly the one I call your attention to, which we've discussed before, is how to, again, how to put our arms around board committee communication. That's with each other and with the board of selectmen. I mean, you appoint a lot of boards. We need to improve that communication process. Uh, a lot of boards work on common issues. We need to improve their communication process with each other. This is a very typical thing in this area in New England. Um, there's a lot of boards in other communities. More of them are elected than in Reading. Uh, you know, if they will, they all have their little cone of expertise and experience, and that's fine if you don't ever want anything to change in a community. When you start to try to have some sort of a top-down planning discussion about change, you need to have much better communication in your boards. And um, you know, shame on on us, I guess, for not having better information flow to all of our boards mm. on things that they should be aware of. Right. So zoning articles, uh, go in a town meeting. You know, Conscom ought to know about them. Let them think of them what they will. They ought to know about them. I don't know if we ever formally tell them. These are some of the things we've talked about internally. It was particularly difficult until three, two, two years ago because Gene had so much part-time help, some regional positions, where there just wasn't the capacity at the staff level to have staff meetings. It was impossible. She couldn't have staff meetings. She had one today. They're almost all full-time employees except for Jane Burns. Um, now at least the staff communication at the baseline is much better. Um, I think that was an important first step. Now it's up to the boards and us to help the boards communicate with each other a little bit better and you know from from Jean's experience and my experience generally speaking um, the boards are very receptive to knowing more of what's going on even if it doesn't directly affect them but logistically as we've seen you guys have had some great meetings with like CPDC I think mm -hmm. but logistically it's not easy for boards to get together on nights they don't generally meet Scheduled on Tuesday. Day. We met on Wednesday. Oh boy, what are we going to do? <coughs> and now we're going to be going all those committee pick up. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's still an open issue. Um, you know, we'll talk about it when we get to FY18. That's the only goal I think we really didn't hit very well. Um, uh, John um, Halsey met with um, a couple of us for staff, and we're looking at the, some of the selectmen's policies. I'll follow up with you uh, later this week on some of those things. I think again, everyone uh, did a good job on vast majority of this list and when you remember how much time and effort went into the override starting last summer and into the fall um, you know I'm, I'm very proud that everyone did such a good job on this uh, and for the first time in a few years and I know I'll regret saying this we're almost fully staffed so that's a big help um, it's hard to have one person doing two people's jobs sometimes so I, I also included a lot of detail that I really don't feel obliged to go into tonight for you to you know, review, comment on, if you will. And this might serve you more as a basis for the town manager evaluation discussion. Um, so I've, I've made some comments in here as we do just about every quarter. Um, that's it for FY17, unless there's any outstanding questions. Comments from the board. I Andrew. just have a comment on that, uh, on goal number 12. First of all, I think there are, you have way too many goals. Um, and so, so I felt that, especially given our financial situation in town, that there is sort of a mechanism in place 
I say this with some reluctancy because now I'm slugging and I'm supposed to go to liaison meetings, but we do have a mechanism by which, even if we can't make the meetings, we can get an email from the chair of what are the big ticket items they're looking at, and then we as a board during our liaison reports can just give a three bullet report on what each board committee commission is doing, and, and then that's a sort of a, we become the central location for information on, in effect, what's happening on all the boards, committees, and commissions. So you hear it, we all hear it. Um, just a thought. So do you think there would be value to sort of push that down the road a little? Is there value for some or all of the boards you folks appoint in almost having a written comment to you on a regular basis, be it quarterly, might be too much, twice a year? Would you find that helpful? Yeah. I think if we just, you know, first of all, none of us can get to all of our liaison right. assignment meetings all the time. You know, I'm the library liaison. Um, I've gone to one since we reorganized. More just to kind of, you know, introduce what we're doing, you know, sort of the whole process on the override, and then ask them, hey, you know, what's going on with you guys? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, and I didn't go to the last one. So, um, but I get the minutes, and I get the agenda. And I do go through them, and I just sort of see what they what they did. Now, sometimes, um, you know, they're more informative than others. Um, but perhaps we can, uh, although the library we don't appoint, so perhaps right. we can do something, do something differently. But the other ones we can, um, you know, just a review of the minutes, and and maybe it's a conversation with the chair. You know, the liaison and the chair talk every quarter. What's going on? What do you, how can we help you? What do you need? Um, this is what's going on that will impact your work over the next six months. We will, you know, and then, you know, when needed, we report it in our liaison report. But I mean, I do get, I mean, I get, I get stuff all the time from the, um, what I'm a liaison to, and I go through it. I, I just don't go to them. Well, the idea, I mean, you got to think about the fact that there are 16 nights in a month that these meetings go on, and we, on average, have six or seven appointment assignments besides the two that we have here, which means somewhere between eight and 10 of the 16 nights that are available is where we would have to be, assuming they don't cross rough each other right. and there's two at the same time, well, so sometimes uh, which happens. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, and I, a, a more technological approach, even if it's that's a telephone call, is gonna have to be implemented or we have to operate with less committees. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one or the other because you really can't possibly physically, you know, make them. I mean, you can't get to all of them. Or turn it around. Don't just look at it from our perspective. From the committee's view, they've been asked to, to do something. If they don't see a regular face from us, I do think they get siloed. And they, they walk into a position of, um, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do, but, I, and, and, but let's focus our attentions over here. I think it, for no fault of anyone, it just lends itself to this kind of very siloed approach, and then when something really does happen, you don't have the relationships that are. Uh, I can they, do, they do come in once a year. I mean, for the most part, oh, no, they know. all don't come in. No. no, it's a small subset that regularly come in. I do think it's incumbent on us to uh, reach out and get the bullet point list of what they're up to every month or whatever, and then speak it here so that you know what the uh, Climate Advisory Committee is. We all know it. The reason I am sensitive is to this is because I don't know how many years ago, four or five years ago, when we changed the age of to buy tobacco in Reading, the Board of Health did, and never informed the Board of Selectmen at the time, more out of ignorance than out of, and then, then you, the Board of Selectmen at the time were totally caught off guard. And so um, I think that can be avoided if we have a conversation or an email with the chair, what are your big ticket items that we need to do? There's two issues. I think you're poking at one, which is the operational part. I do think there's a second point, which is John's poking at, which is just the sheer efficiency of an, of an organization that has 26 heads. Um, we really need to be consciously or the size of government in the sense that it has a real cost. It may not be denominated in dollars. It may be denominated in our hours, which have no cost. 
it may be denominated in overtime that people. Well, it has no cost to the to the municipality. To the municipality, has plenty of. I want my two hours back sometimes, right? Just plenty of meetings we get into, and you say, not necessarily here, but it worked. Gee, I wish I had my 15 minutes back. Um, so if we don't have regular meetings with these boards, we won't grasp the magnitude and size and efficiency of this organization that we just won't have any way to endure it. And that's what's really going to inform our thinking about how we should go forward. So I think there is value, Bob, in having folks come in front of us, even if they don't today, and maybe you prescribe it so it's a 10-minute brief and it happens once a quarter or twice a year. If for no other reason than to force the organization to realize, my goodness, we're enormous. What do we, you know, th this can't be this way, right? Or maybe it's, we should put more in resources here because it should be this way. Well, it'll change the scope of these meetings, but it's a far more efficient way um, of, of getting, because all we've talked about right now is half the issue. It's, it's bringing back here what they're, what they're working on. What about, you know, what we, want. what we would like, you know, because these are committees that are advisory to us and you know, so we haven't even begun to discuss that, that piece. I mean, I've campaigned for years around, and I don't know how often this is, but even if it's a chair, vice chair, when you have 30 plus committees, besides the elected committees, all running off in different directions and never having either a, at least a, I think at least a semi-annual um, gathering where one hand knows what the other one's doing. This has been a this has been an, a growing problem in my opinion, especially as the budget tightens, as things become you know you know more difficult and need to be managed more closely. We have not brought the chair vice chair under one roof at least semi-annually, so that people on conservation and historic have a good idea what's going on from a budgetary standpoint. I mean, it's not fair to them to try to do their job without that information coming from us, in my opinion. And so I would suggest that we call it a summit, call it whatever you want to call it. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a massive, all 35 committees, all their members show up, but a chair, vice chair. No, I agree. You know, the prescribed format. We've, about that, yeah, we've, we've been talking about it for four years now. Um, Without yeah. that, we just have no sense of the size and scope, and we're really driving somewhat rudderless in some areas. Yeah, and one of the challenges um, from our side is we don't necessarily staff all these volunteer yeah. boards. Some of them, no Reading employee ever goes to a meeting. Right. Um, they do their own minutes. They post their own agendas. They are completely autonomous. And that's not by our choice. We just soon help them. We just don't have people. Um, you know, as the government has cut its budget, it has not cut its committees. And we've pushed more work in some cases onto the committees. And that was particularly true, again, when we cut um, a lot of Gene's administrators in half or worse. And CONSCOM, as an example, got a lot more work to do themselves. And they let us know. And they had some really good points. So we were able to put a full-time person back. But Nowhere along the process was a discussion really of let's evaluate this as a work problem as opposed to let's just cut the position in half and off we go. Um, some boards can't change their amount of work. I'll say loosely the planning boards and the land use boards. They have to, you know, they're statutory, they have to do what they do. Right. Those boards. At some but point, we staff those. Um, not historic not West Side historic, but the rest, I think so. Um, CPDC and ZBA, we staff. Uh, ZBA, no. Oh, not. we don't staff? The building inspector used to go and then stopped. Oh, yeah. So, again, you know, because if I had resources at all these meetings, you guys would get a lot better flow also because I'd give it to you. But I don't have it. I can't give you something I don't have. So this is actually a kind of a big issue. I, I think it's a... get people on the same page. I think it's really a big issue. Being on the same page in the environment that we're in today is really important. Yeah. And, the, and the fact that we don't have the resources to do that says we have to come up with a different methodology, in yeah, my I opinion, think, or think, you know, change the, change the scope of what we're dealing with. Yeah, and I think the financial forums have been around for a long time before me. 
they're very successful. We do a good job at finance generally. Um, there's no surprises where one of the elected boards suddenly says, oh my gosh, I didn't know about this. You need the same approach to other groups of boards. Yes. You know, land use boards is a simple thing to say, but I'm not even sure I could give you what that list should be. But you need to have some kind of forums, not for everyone because it doesn't make sense, but for like-minded groups. And some groups will hang out there as there is no one like them. Would it be inappropriate, you know, I mean, we reorganize, we reorganize typically following an election. So let's say sometime in April we're reorganized. Um, to have at least an, do the committees do that? I don't know. They do what they choose to do. Correct. And so it almost makes me think. Well, yeah, the committees though, we're appointing them generally June 30th. Well, because we're doing the June 30 thing. If you look at our policy, if you look at the selectman's policy that currently exists at the moment, <coughs> we're not supposed to reorganize till June. That's not exactly true. We can organize whenever we want. That is correct. It, but it's the suggestion yeah. was that you would do this in June. Yeah. That's the suggestion of the policy. And of course, you can do what you need to do. It's our policy, so if we need to adjust, we're going to do it. All I'm suggesting is that we start to line these things up in a way that they get to be, you know, more manageable. And if you did an annual summit, I mean, look, when you when you become a selectman, there's there's a state organization that offers you a training program if you want to go to it. Um, you go or you don't go. Um, but here we are. We have people that join our committees. We reappoint them. We recruit them. And Frankly, we don't give them at least an annual opportunity to all come together in one place so that everybody can kind of get on the same page with us and understand what the plan is. Um, and, I, you know, more often than that may be onerous, but I don't think it's too much to ask to think about if you, if you get something like that done, pick the time. It can be September, it can be May. It's It probably shouldn't be from between the time school's out and the time school reconvenes because, you know, people disappear, you know, rightfully. But, you know, I do think that on the shoulders of that summer getaway, we should be doing some kind of an annual summit of chairs and vice chairs to get everybody on the same page. I well, just let's at least try. <laughs> won't know till you try. The other thought that, that triggers in my mind is um, with such new, such um, <laughs> A volume of new people coming onto committees. It'd be helpful to have um, um, normalized open meeting training for folks yeah. to kind of get uptake. You've yeah. talked about that before. In, any progress on that, Bob? I know you fly out. Yeah, there's there's two parts of it. One of it is, if you will, state driven, and the state will come out. The AG's office will send someone. Uh, Martha Coakley came out years ago. And then the rest is what the selectmen want to accomplish in that meeting once they're there. So there's there's open meeting law and ethics but you have an opportunity to do more because open meeting law and ethics is not a long topic actually. How long did you think it would be? Okay. So you got everyone in the room and in the past we've done a part two which was you know, the Board of Selectmen would make some comments, whatever they were. I don't even remember honestly what they You were. could get something done very efficiently and it could be highly productive in two hours, I think. I would think 90 minutes. We don't need to belabor the point. If you did training, questions and you know 90 minutes thereabouts would be done before nine o'clock what i had suggested to you at some point i think it was february or march i started to talk about it was it's it's a really good idea to get groups of people together there's no question about that but to get them together for an open meeting law might be a little bit dry yeah. or for anything else um, so that's why i suggested some projects where common boards had to come together and solve a problem and there's at least one or two of those in the FY18 goals. That's another way to approach it, is throw an issue out there, whatever it is. Um, say, all right, you know, this hits your <coughs> four boards in one way or the other. You guys go figure it out. Come to the board with a su suggested solution to the problem we've given. I think working on an exercise would be much more valuable, honestly, if we can come up with valuable exercises. Well, one's compliance, one's more operational. Yeah. How do you hit the compliance and the operation? You've got to hit the compliance either at the same time or separately, but that's, I see. We need to do a much better job, I'll say, onboarding volunteers like we do employees. 
We don't do a perfect job of employees either, but we do a lot better than I, volunteers. I, I talked to Alan, and, and yeah. uh, we don't do a great job of onboarding town meeting members. Right. I mean, you know, look at the folks that are extensively voting on policy. And we have a third, third town meeting. Members were brand new, and they, their first introduction was the meeting that they went to. Yeah, and we discussed that in the Charter Committee. I, I still happen to think it's terribly wrong to have an election and then a town meeting. I think the last thing you do is your town meeting and then you have an election. So people have a whole cycle to catch up. But you're asking potentially one-third of town meeting if there was a full slate uh, to decide on things they're walking into very, two very weeks very before. <laughs> but that's, that was tradition and that wasn't going to change. And that's, not, that's common. They're, both ways are done this area, but our way is more common. I don't think it's very efficient. But if the town meeting never turns over, it's fine. What's the difference? All you had to do was look at the last town meeting and to understand that there were many new members, which is great, um, and and they were apologizing for, yeah, not, understanding. for not understanding. And, I, and those are know, the ones who actually spoke. What about the ones yeah, who and then, yes, you're right, because there are many that are just going, whoa. I'm not getting in the middle of this until I figure out what's going on. And it may be a year before they yeah. feel comfortable because they've been, you know, thrown into the fire kind of literally within a matter of a couple of weeks. I mean, I think that that's something we really should bring up as a topic with town meeting because it's a charter issue. Um, and, I, and I think it should be open to discussion that we might want to rethink I mean, and you got to do this on a runway. I mean, you can't just do that um, to rethink some of that timing. Because, Bob, I think you're really right about the, the juxtaposition of our elections in Reading and what we're asking newly elected people to well, do. And your situation is perfect. The board reorganizes, and then the new chair has to give a state of the Correct. town address two weeks later. Yeah. Welcome to uh, the select. And, you know. At least, that, at least the new chair was on the board yeah. generally. Typically, yeah. 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 So. Uh, so it's not like completely blindsided, but still, uh, I just, I do think that they're in, they're, there's an inverse order to the way that the, that okay. is being done in Reading at the moment. There's, there's a community that Ray mentioned, I don't remember who they are, that they have their annual town meeting and the last item of business is the local election. So think about that. <coughs> do it on a Saturday. Somewhere around two o'clock, the and then they show. then they have their then election. They announce the, the, the elections already happened during the day. Then they announce the results at the as the last business of the town meeting. The new board of selectmen will be, you know, whatever the town meeting members will be. I thought that was pretty interesting. That is. So they have the election on a Saturday. Yes. That is. There's there are a number of communities so that, that do. That means during a meeting of the board of selectmen, you're sitting there, and it's the last article of the evening. You're fired. Exactly. That's, that, that's exactly what happens. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah. That's right. Well, it saves the sign holding out on the election day. Uh, well, Bob, which I, I, I know, I should know this, but um, our agendas are all, often um, filled with boards coming to talk to us. Which are the ones that don't? I mean, I know I'd have to really have. look at a Over half of them. Actually, that's yeah, a good point, half. Barry. Could we get a listing of those yeah. that don't? Yeah. Who are the those that don't come frequently and who, who don't get a lot of because you you see more than boards you see like the MAPC rep that's sure. the board right. yeah um, the ice arena I think over half of the boards that are this advisory to us never come in here on so a regular we basis don't invite them or do we invite yeah. them and they say uh, no it's because we don't invite them well maybe we should look at that well you have to if it's going to serve yeah. a capacity it's got to work and that's the thing that's missing the reason they're there is to do useful work and we're not getting the work done that's the Irony here. It makes our meetings a little longer. You can't just say, "Come and give us an update." That's not enough. No, you got to give them more. Right, but it's like okay, to, you know, but but if, but prior to their coming in, you know, they do a you know a, a two-page report. This is what we've been working on. This is what, yeah. you know, these are our accomplishments. It gets into our packets. So we have time to read it. These are the things that we really would like to do going forward, um, and then that becomes a discussion. It's like, well, wait a minute. Right, well, what, what do I think about doing this instead? And then that, there's their agenda for the following year. Yeah, you know, I'll give you an example that's just a recent one. Um, my memory, the climate committee, through different chairs, has always done a really good job of reaching out to me, it seems, and saying, you know, what are the issues the selectmen are interested in? 
um, here's what we're doing, and, and preparing for your meeting, very much so. And when they come in and have a presentation, that's just not off the cuff. That's no, been discussed they're, they're for a couple months. Prepared, yeah. um, but that's how they are, that, and they are, they're very respectful of the fact you appoint them, and they, and they want to use your time well. That's not a bad model, uh, but they ask to do it. Other boards don't, and I'm not saying they should. Well, maybe that's part of the, yeah. part of the uh, job description. Yeah. Of the chair. Maybe, okay. maybe it's the, the session of the chairs and co-chairs. So that everybody understands kind of what they're, you know, it's not only just doing what your subject matter is, it's reporting back to the board and communicating with your liaison. Any other comments on the fiscal 17 before we move on? Okay, why don't we move to 18. Let's um, turn here's the page. 18 behind me. Um, this is obviously not going to be solved tonight. I just wanted to give a start. Uh, I have the same, well, similar groups, not exactly the same. We have um, the senior tax relief going into place this year. Uh, you will have tax classification. That's a big topic this year. Victor and I each have our thoughts kind of on how to approach it. We'll try to agree at some point. Applications are due in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, the August. The form has not yet gone through town council. It will be in the next week or so. So August 1st is when applications will be uh, first allowed. Are, are we right doing now. something to communicate that? Uh, yeah, we've had a, he's already had a couple bill, of It was in the water bill. <laughs> I never see those. My wife doesn't yeah, allow me. <laughs> Yeah, the application should be out there probably in the next 10 days. We didn't want it to go out in June. People forget about it, although now it's getting a little late. Um, it seems like there's three parts to the override. There's the financial overview that we've already pretty much cut down. There's a department head need to sit down and talk about town priorities so that when we present you with a list, we've all had that discussion, and that's not going to happen overnight. We'll work on that. Then there's the general, um, I, I especially want your feedback on communication. Um, that's Jane Miller's thing. Jane and Matt will work on that. Um, we had an economic development meeting today that Jane was part of. She's really good at knowing how people communicate. You know, that used to be her business. Um, here's one of these community projects, if you will, that can bring a couple boards together. You'll see a staff lead, a name you don't recognize. Um, that's our new treasurer. His name is, um, I hope he doesn't change his mind. Uh, Andre Kume. Um, he most recently comes to us from Babson College. Okay. So he's um, a really, really talented, very interesting guy and a Reading resident. What did he do at Babson? Um, some of it was charitable giving. <laughs> he doesn't know about this yet. But, um, yeah, he's, he's a financially curious guy, and that's what we call Someone who's really, he doesn't, he doesn't ever bring you a problem. He just brings you three solutions to a problem you didn't know. <laughs> So this would involve, again, two or three of the groups, such as the commissioners and trust funds. And I'm, I'm going on now. Uh, that's the assistant library director now, Waring. Um, Nelson Burbank said to me many, many years ago, more than 10, um, if this town would organize charitable giving, you'd get a lot more charity. I don't know if that's the business of municipal government or not, as opposed to, you know, a charitable foundation, but let's at least find out all the things that go on in Reading. A lot of it's athletics, but it's not all athletics. And let's uh, put together a list and let's find out what's going on and see if the town should or shouldn't participate in some formal way. I don't know. But no one's ever sat down to truly f try to figure out. Are you talking about on the fundraising side um, or the giving side? I don't know, honestly, John. Because um, that's a really yeah. important distinction yeah. when you think about that as a general subject I had matter. at first thought giving, but as I thought about it more, I didn't know if I wanted to draw the line there. So I don't know. Well, you know, there have been many organizations in this town that are nonprofit themselves yeah. in general or groups of citizens who have shown great interest in doing things with and for the town, partnering. Um, and I think that fits under this umbrella. I mean, well, the fact that, for instance, Babe Ruth takes care of fields, it might not be giving in the traditional sense, but it's important to know about that. Well, I will tell you that, so for that as an example, um, if you look at neighboring towns, that has a, 
has an economic value to this town of over $100,000 a year. Yeah. Good example. Because the neighboring towns all have a person yeah. that does that. And, you know, they're all in cost, you know, and I'm not talking about somebody who is highly compensated. I'm talking by the time you get a competitive wage and a benefit package all tied together, that's a $100,000 cost. And that partnership, for example, um, is probably saving the town the greatest majority of that cost. Or it would be not serviced. Right, exactly. Which is... The, which is you should not take care of your assets. Exactly. And your assets, those assets diminish in a blink. I mean, there's another example of that that just recently happened, as you know, Bob. Um, you know, we've got uh, Sturgis Park. There's a softball field, a little league field that has been um, used for, you know, eons. Um, it's never had any water down there. And a new... Right kind. Well, correct. It's never had controlled source of keeping the field, you know, you know, service properly is from a water standpoint. New, uh, you know, the Reading Little League softball comes into comes into creation over the last year, and one of the first things they do at the end of their first year is they make a five thousand um, dollar contribution to make that happen. You know, at no cost to the town. So we need to be able to explore those those philanthropic partnerships, um, and I think that's. That may be where this fits. I can think as well, Bob. You know, this probably aligns mostly to athletics, as you said. But I can tell, as a parent on the other side of that, 20 years ago, we were very <coughs> confused about how we had plenty of labor, we had plenty of can-do attitude, we had a bunch of ideas. We had no idea how the proceeds should best be fit back into the organization. We're not a, we're not a nonprofit. We don't want to be a nonprofit. We just want to raise money for the kids. We're parents. I imagine there's a lot of that at the town level that would happen, but it's a chicken and an egg problem. So this is a this is a great idea. And then you get to the giving part and you think about um, whether it's uh, in-kind contributions. Um, we'll need to have quite a bit of policy in that area to figure all that out. Yeah, that's good. And it's not really just exclusively athletics either. Uh, you know, the, the first time, well, not the first time, but recently, you know, a young man, um, came to me uh, he had an interest in guess what the bandstand at memorial oh, yeah that's right you know he plays there you know he plays and it, you know he, he performs there and you know in his role as an aspiring eagle scout he wanted to replace it and we actually assembled some people and you know it just the scope of the project was way beyond you know what somebody you know in his position trying to raise resources we're going to be able to, to do but the the sense of it is there and it's not just athletics it's a lot of oh, other, it's a lot of other things and that needs to be explored and developed I mean, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in town already that people are doing either on their own or through different organizations i was on the board of the reading scholarship foundation they give every year north of one hundred and fifty thousand right. um, dollars to kids graduating high school in Reading to go to go on to college, um, you know the all the schools, the, you know the, from the PTOs, um, the Reading Educational <coughs> Fund, you know, raising not small amounts of money. The Young Women's League, which you know people here are on, significant amounts of money. So I, I would want to make sure that whatever we do doesn't sort of overstep on the wonderful things that are already happening here, and I but and I don't. I kind of, I guess I'm not sort of seeing, I mean, obviously there are holes, things that aren't getting done, but I, I want to just make sure that, you know, that, because it's, it's the same people that would be giving, but they're already maybe giving to some other things, whether it be a softball thing or the Young Women's League or the Educational the Scholarship Foundation. You know, do, do we don't want to necessarily poach the good things that are happening now. That's why I said I don't really know what the role of town government really should be. Yeah, it's less about right. poaching yeah. and more about organizing. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, if, you, if there's a if there's kind of an organizational move, so that it comes back to this one hand knowing what the other one's doing. I mean, there are, you're absolutely right. There are a load of organizations in this town. Uh, you've mentioned several of them. You know, the Reading Rotary Club. 
probably you know spends over a hundred thousand dollars a year in, in you know back into this town what's missing in my opinion is a central way to have it if it's if it's coordinated I'm not saying take it over and I'm not saying put a damper on any of it or not, or control it I'm suggesting you know some organizational backup that might help I think you've tried this with uh, the cultural group. Yes, I was thinking of them, and I was also yeah. Thinking, the image of herding cats came into mind. But <laughs> um, part of this is just marketing, making John twenty years ago more aware of what his options were as a parent. So that's not the role of government to tell you what to do or you absolutely. Know, but just much like we are working informally again with just a you know an ad hoc group of cultural folks that to organize themselves, helping them think through as a group how they can do things as a group more effectively than individual. Oh, they still want us to buy them at the community center. <laughs> so that's number five. Um, finance department policies with some new staff is, is a very important thing um, for Sharon to do. You've got a preview of public works uh, policies. You'll see another one fall on that. <coughs> HR and Matt and Jean want to work on the topic of employee retention. Some of that's financial, a lot of that is not financial. That's something that the three of them actually came to me about and they're just going to work on, so I can only guess at what it is. But obviously turnover is one of the most expensive things an organization can go through and I'll tell you when I first uh, became town manager, I, I didn't take it personally, but we had a lot of turnover. We had a lot of retirements. 45 year veterans at DPW going around the same time. It had been known, it had been planned, but for an organization of our size to replace 25% of the workforce over 18 months is not easy. Um, and especially to keep doing work in the meanwhile. So retention is important, and obviously, as um, you know, the younger generation comes into our workforce, it becomes a much more important topic. We'll see where that goes. We've not had much of a public discussion on purpose on the fact that town meeting did fund a building security study. I do have a final version, a final draft version. I will be uh, putting together a meeting of chairs and vice chairs of the three elected boards, I think. We're going to talk about it Thursday at the staff level with Amy, John Doherty, and myself. Uh, and then we'll get a sense of what the chairs, vice chairs would like to do. But it seems almost for sure that you're going to need an executive session with the three elected boards to discuss you know, there's a price tag on some security improvements suggested as to how does this fit into the financial picture of the town. So we'll give you more on that. Um, it's, they did an excellent job. I'll say it's very thorough. Um, I've asked both chiefs to this summer do a staffing study of uh, <coughs> our, our 25 or so peer communities formally, not just how many cops, what do they do, how many police, you know, how many patrol, how many sergeants, lieutenants, SROs, school resource officers. They've already begun that. Does this get at uh, what's ample staffing vis-a-vis -vis overtime and, and so Yeah, we're going to have to, at, at, I saw analysis, that discussion then. Uh, at, at, at income, yeah, I've actually a little bit. had a little chat with the union president yesterday. I said it's, it's in all our best interest to all understand the generators of overtime we choose to do to fix it, you might not agree with me and that's okay, but we all need to understand what's going on here. Um, you know, and we all have a rough idea of how many more firefighters would cause the overtime problem to be better behaved, but you know, I, I will give you a preview that some of the reasons for those transfers were uncertainty and safety at the end of the fiscal year. Um, public safety is going to turn back well more than the 25000 extra that they got. That was a just-in-case number. And that's a philosophical question. I heard someone on FinCom bring up snow and ice, which you know, had a certain amount of merit to compare, and not entirely. For public safety overtime, you want to over budget because you can't afford not to have the money if you need it, and you want to turn it back. That's a hard thing to do when we're having a tight financial, financial time. Snow and ice is really the opposite. You want to under budget because you don't want to tie up those resources if it doesn't snow. And the state doesn't help you if you do. So, you know, we could have a philosophical discussion about, well, let's not budget an extra 50 grand in public safety overtime anymore. And when I say budget, I also mean ask for money at FinCom, town meeting, whatever. 
um, let's wait until now, this time in July, and then have an emergency meeting of FinCom and the selectmen when we know what the facts are. We could do that legally. That's possible. But now you've, you've depleted your FinCom reserve budget in July. Well, that's, that's the problem. Technically, it's okay for FinCom for a certain period of time to vote a prior year's FinCom reserve. We thought it was bad practice. We did it once in an emergency. Technically, it's not good. So I think public safety staffing will be a big topic. But that's going to be a big discussion. piece. That's going to really inform a lot of the budget yeah. discussions in terms of when we decide, you know, what, what, what is adequately <coughs> staffed? How many, on, how many sworn officers do you need to be at? I mean, the chiefs will tell you they'll do the greatest job they can do, whatever you give them. But that's not the, that's not the answer. That's not the question. The question is, what do we really need? And what's the financially, you know, if we're, if we're gonna if we're gonna run it really thin and then wind up giving it back plus more in overtime, what did we gain? Yeah, and I don't think we do give it back in overtime, just for my editorial comment. But they need to present facts. Well, that's, that would be helpful going into the budget discussion. Yeah, and I, I want them to have that available for the uh, September financial forum. Good. Um, <clears throat> there's still some work. Um, Matt is doing it with the town council and the bylaw committee. Uh, they're bringing some, I haven't seen them, some set of general bylaws to November town meeting. Uh, we've got a preview of personnel policies. Those will be back in front of you after we close the year again. Um, I talked to our former HR uh, director, actually, some some degree today and she's going to work with labor council now that we've be careful what i say um, we have one year agreements with all of our unions so we need to re-engage another bargaining cycle so we want to have a legal review in preparation for that cycle um, it's not a not a lot of heavy lifting but it's much like you saw in the personnel policies discussion it's making sure that in the union contract you have modern language so equal opportunity employer meant something a lot different 20 years ago with words than it means now. We haven't necessarily ever looked at our contracts except for things that we were arguing about. That wasn't one of them. So we really need a legal scrub of all that. Uh, Board of Selectmen policies you're pretty well familiar with. Um, we'll knock those off as, as best we can. Um, it's time for Reading to redo its affordable housing production plan. I was really surprised at that. I think we have to do it potentially by next January, if I'm right. Is it going to be 10 years? Uh, yeah. I didn't realize it was 10 years for a while. So, so the fact that we got the um, stay of execution from the state is still up there. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you know, a topic that will come up is uh, the DPW uh, yard and cemetery garage issue you're pretty familiar with. I'm not sure if we need any more executive session meetings. We might need one more. That discussion's ready to go public uh, over next year, and maybe a little sooner. You, I missed the meeting, but you had a discussion on the cell tower water storage issue. Um, my only comment will be um, the town cannot forbid carriers. That's the FCC that decides that. So just because we don't like it doesn't mean they won't be here in whatever location the FCC says is okay. So, but obviously, maybe it wasn't obvious. We had brought it as a beginning of a discussion. It's funny, when I watched uh, the replay of your meeting, I asked almost all the same questions that came up that night of staff. You know, what are our alternative locations are there? And, yes. mm -hmm. and you know, they, they knew, they're looking at it. It just didn't actually come out in the presentation that way, and that's okay. Um, you heard from the Elder Human Services that they've really outgrown or soon will outgrow their space. So that's suddenly become a five year from now project. I think it's now a one or two year from now project we gotta take seriously. It's not in the capital plan, it needs to be in the capital plan. We need to have a discussion. Uh, honestly, Oakland Road is uh, a good location. You know, I will tell you when I once said I had an interesting three party solution for Oakland Road that it was revolving around elder human services. Um, and some of that discussion is still possible. Believe it or not, our master plan is out of date. That's more than 10 years ago. We do such a good job with all the pieces that we don't sort of feel obliged to do a master plan. Some communities only do a master plan and don't have all those little pieces. But that's something that generally and traditionally the selectmen have driven. Um, you can do that or you can have staff do it, but it's something that we need to start talking about in the next year. <coughs> 
I had a long meeting today, actually just <coughs> two of them, with uh, Andrew and Jesse for economic development. Is Jesse still the school yeah. engaged? Okay. She's working on the old project and she's working on visuals for the website and some other marketing material that's really very slick. Um, I'll say that in general the goal is to have an October uh, economic development summit. Uh, details to be announced. And, but for planning purposes that feels like tomorrow to me so it's a little scary. Um, Andrew has made an enormous amount of contacts, important contacts. Um, there's a handful of very strong developers very interested to come to a summit like that. Because they're impressed by what they've heard from Andrew. So now we have to live up to his mark. He's doing a really good job in sales out there. Yeah, I think so. We got to be able to back him. Yeah. And I, I think we'll work with um, you know the chair and the vice chair. I, I'm, I'm sure before an October summit, he's going to want to come in and give you some kind of an update, yep. and some kind of a preview, and ask for your feedback. Um, uh, yeah, I'm interested to kind of see. What he said to me was today, um, the someone asked him, "What's the audience for a summit?" He says, "Well, it's two audiences." First and foremost, and he actually said this, I'm not making it up, is the Board of Selectmen. Um, they're the ones that are driving this bus, so we have to really understand you know, what's in their wheelhouse. And secondly, is private developers. So they understand, they get a picture of the town. Um, you know, we show them what the economic development opportunities are. One of the things Jesse and Andrew were working on today is a very visual way to show all the land that's available in town for sale, public or private. Um, most towns don't do that. We used to have it in a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet doesn't tell you much. A visual with a map, you can go look at a picture, you see all the details, contact information. That's how economic development happens. Is that a GIS thing? Yeah, very much. Very much so. Part of that summit, do we organize a little uh, bus tour? We might have a virtual bus tour. We'll put up VR goggles, we'll have everyone drive. I want to do a drone tour of Reading, actually. I think as a marketing piece, a drone would be the right way to go. So, um, the last group, uh, you're pretty well familiar with cable negotiations and the MWRA project. Uh, we have a meeting set for two weeks with the MW or with North Reading. I'm actually meeting with Mike this Thursday to talk about the IMA just informally. And then, um, I'm not sure, I think it's, is it Dan and John Arena that are going to those now? I know you used to. I don't think well, I just couldn't make the last yeah, meeting. I, I don't know that we've really discussed who should be going to those. I I missed one. I've, I've missed Dan, one meeting. Yeah, and John took your place. Right. So yeah, I'm interested. That's a topic I'm familiar with. And so we really need to have only two of you go, though. Okay. That's all. We just don't want three. Yeah, you go. You go. Uh, this is another community project, the historical preservation. The uh, the library either has or will soon a pro. A, Apply for a grant. They actually, I think they did. They may have just done it recently. Yeah, but they wanted to lead that, and obviously, uh, um, you know, town clerk would be really involved in that. Um, you know, some of you are familiar with what we have in this building downstairs, and it's rather appalling. This is right up the library's wheelhouse, and this would involve, again, several of your, some of your boards, four or five of your boards getting together and working on a task together. Um, One of the things that they were talking about is not necessarily like, okay, this is where we'll store archival stuff, but actually looking at the whole town. And right. Sometimes it's sometimes it could be stuff that's at a church, or it could be in a local. Okay, I didn't know. think of the church, but that's what uh, I. Or just things that are, you know, because there are things, historical things in that, that are not in our basement that are just scattered throughout the town. And looking at it as a comprehensive piece as opposed to, okay, this is where we'll store. Second to last one is the thing we were just discussing quite a bit, is what do we do to better prepare our volunteers, and that's still a wide open topic. Uh, but I, I threw that in Laura's lap since I know it'll involve open meeting law, at least. And then lastly, another one of these groups. Um, I'm not sure how valuable this one is at this time, but we had discussed, again, doing an inventory of community events and trying to decide what role the town has. So Friends and Family Day, if you will, is outsourced. Fall Street Fair is now outsourced. Um, you know, what are the things that the community wants to do? And, and this definitely revolves around, um, if you will, economic development. And Gene has um, a current uh, effort, and I think it's called placemaking. I don't understand all these planning terms, so I didn't really get it, but I saw a lot of pretty pictures from other towns. 
you know, basically it makes your town look a little nicer than maybe it is. And that's good, <laughs> that's fine. But one of them is community events. I'll tell you, Wakefield does a great job in community events and their government is almost not involved at all other than Steve goes to them. He's told everywhere <coughs> to go. Yeah, those are July 4th activities. Uh, they private have. groups. They do the parade, there's a parade group. Um, there's just uh, there's a Italian festival that's yeah, they're all autonomous they're all autonomous. Yeah. I don't know if they talk to each other I don't know if it's similar people I have no idea I just know they work well similar things happening in Cambridge I mean you know really? local neighborhood associations yeah. and, and business associations there are events going on in neighborhoods um, in Cambridge like the events that go on in Wakefield yeah we've talked and very little talked. government involvement some support as as requested We've talked um, internally about creating events, maybe one time, like the Fall Street Fair was created as a one-time event, probably when it was first created, no one knows, um, to promote the downtown for economic development, get all the restaurants out there someday, you know, have a whatever, Saturday afternoon, Friday night. Um, Salt Lake City does a great one, I've seen <coughs> That night is not a money maker for any of the restaurants, but it's, if you will, a cheap advertising. And then they start seeing the walk in traffic from the people that are, where well, did you find us? Oh, I went to that, uh, that fair. It, it so. becomes, a ready to become, become a destination as opposed to, well, I'm gonna go to the advertising restaurant. Well, the, the Taste of Metro is, yeah, is, is such an event, and, and it creates, it's very little cost yep. to, the, to the restaurants. And they all swarm for it. I mean, you know, there's 35 of them in this year. But that's an intra event. That's internal. This would be an extra event, kind of outside on a summer night. Maybe. Um, did you see Boston this for the did the, for the first time a pizza event? Yeah. Thankfully, I didn't go. It was yeah. it was over overbooked. Yeah, it was very much oversubscribed and a little bit. You know, they had some growing pains, but. But that shows you an appetite. There's no reason Reading couldn't call up, have a pizza night. Certainly have enough pizza places. Certainly have enough pizza places. <laughs> oh, we also we have about 375th coming up. That's that, you know, that, that can certainly bring a lot of people together. So I've listed recreation and elder human services as parts of this. I don't know what it really is going to evolve to. I'll let them discuss it for a while and think about it. And then um, if there's other topics, I tried to think of all the big issues, but we don't always have them on lists and make sure they were tucked in here, but if you've got something that I missed, by all means, let me know. And if, you know, if something's not on the list, doesn't mean we won't do it anyways. I, I did Maybe. have one, one thing, having been, a, one of the big regrets I had of, of my tenure on the Board of Health was not really taking the opiate uh, epidemic as seriously as, as I probably should have. And I understand that, that um, our cost is gonna, it's got some data that they're gonna be coming out with that's it's pretty eye-opening, eye and, and, and maybe that's something that could fit under community and could, would be a, a thing where you have boards, committees working together. Um, in this case, I think, uh, obviously, the police, the, our CASA, Board of Health, these are all, you know, it's a, it's, it's a health issue, it's a our CASA, our CASA issue, it's a police issue. And um, Well, for, for example, in September, that's Awareness Month yeah. for our CASA and you know, like-minded organizations. And there are already a series of events planned. Um, I know I was able to connect them with the, the Chamber of Commerce who's gonna sponsor an event. And, and you know, so this comes back to something we talked about up top a little bit. Sometimes just being a central point of coordination so that everybody knows what everybody's doing becomes really valuable to who do I call to do this I think this is a this is a situation where we're having relatively young people dying with some frequency that has certainly got my attention and and it'd be nice to pool the resources of the Board of Health uh, one of their members is a substance abuse uh, specialist uh, the, the police and our CASA and get them working together on some a more aggressive program to deal with I, I think to Sean's point um, more information would help you realize a lot of that's already done maybe the Board of Health's not involved but um, you know there is a liaison to the board directors meeting if they want to come 
um, the last meeting we had was exclusively on September with all the different right. events planned. And maybe shame on us for not bringing them to you and talking about them more, but one of the things we've talked about absolutely is the federal grant is up in a year from October. Mm -hmm. So as part of the budget process, we need to discuss this topic. And honestly, I don't know the answer. Do we build a budget with our CASA in there in the event of a failed override or not? I don't know. Last time their budget, uh, their grant was up. We, we stepped up. the breach. Yeah, we did. So that's a topic that is is a financial forum topic because it hits schools in the town. And that timing of that grant expiration, it, you will blink, yeah. and that will exactly. be here. Here from October. Um, so. Yes, please. Um, I'm Michelle Sandy, 75 Glendale Circle, and just the topic of the opiate epidemic is extremely concerning. So also with the um, three losses that we've had in um, the Department of Health not having a nurse presently right now is really concerning. So I just am curious as to what the board's doing currently, because I know that the loss of life is increasing, not just in Reading, but across the state, across the country. And um, if there were ways that that information, even if it's in a preliminary state, can be reported out. I think that a lot of parents in this community are very, very nervous. We see a lot of information coming from the state level. We don't really see a lot coming from our local government. So if we could think of ways that that could be addressed now and not you know, waiting for a September awareness, um, I think that's fabulous. I'm not discrediting any work that anybody's done, but it, it's, it's a really scary that I feel like we are not addressing as well as we could. Well, um, every year, the, I think it's every year, the school does a youth risk behavior survey. That's a fairly data intense and lengthy analysis period before the data is public. So that's the way, that's the vehicle currently where information is then released and it's a lot of information as opposed to reacting to a specific circumstance. So that's part of this time frame. But it's the draft data is now available and being studied. So will that data be like a I think in September. I think that was again the plan because I don't know that it's ready for public yet. It needs to be scrubbed. It's actually much more complicated than it should be to coordinate uh, health data. I guess I'll say the privacy laws are so large that for Erica to actually look at death certificates is a manual process no state computerized way and the town is not allowed to do anything she has to physically read certificates of death to help understand <laughs> the impact of deaths from opioids so it without, just gives you a picture okay. without releasing obviously any confidential yep. information though is that going into the police law i'm that sorry is it going in? into oh without uh, without releasing any confidential information of the <coughs> Is an overdose that takes place in Reading or Reading residents being released to the paper in the police law? I don't think no. so. I, I know. I get a text, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't think it is, and I think it's HIPAA. I Reading resident dies in another location other than Reading. There's really not a clear pathway to report that. The only way that you can... So if someone dies of, a, of an overdose, for example, in another community or in another state. There's many near, nearby states. Um, there's not a way for that to find its way into our system except as it's being done manually. So you, know, you, you pull it together, but then, you know, as Bob points out, in order to be able to stay compliant with all of the rules and regulations, that, that material has to be scrubbed, and it's got to be, you know, and, and then come out in presentation form. And that's then, otherwise you'd look at it and it wouldn't make, it, it'd be like, these people don't know what they're doing. It's not matching. So, so the long story short of it is that what our CASA has been doing now for many years, and it's frankly far in advance of almost any other community that is neighbor to us. Um, they come to our CASA on a regular basis in the hopes of finding out how we're gathering information and disseminating it.
and that now has been going on for some significant period of time. So, you know, the methodology of the way it's come together is that that only does find its way out once a year. You're right, and if if there's and, and people rightfully want to react to occurrences. If something happens two or three times in a matter of 90 days, it's like, oh my God, what are we doing? Which is frankly the way our, ca our CASA was formed many years ago when several occurrences happened with no oversight body at all, maybe as long ago as 15, 17, 18 years ago um, is when the need and the spawn of our CASA came to, came to be. So I think it's very difficult to react on the fly. I, I think that uh, Erica's doing a really good job with that, yeah. I think Erica is doing a fantastic job. I met Erica, I've attended workshops that Erica has um, attended. Um, that's not my question or, or, or my concern. It's that you see a theft reported in the paper, you would see a murder reported in the paper without having any obligation not to put that in there because of HIPAA. So why can't an overdose be reported in the paper, I guess is my question. Uh, um, it's a family privacy issue. Um, if you look at the range of uh, responses by families, they rightfully can take it any way they want. Some families will actually publish in the obituary the cause of death and caution other people. Others wish complete privacy and they just need to deal with their grief in their own way. And that's the reason, is that this is not a crime. This is just a fact of something that happened. And it's up to the family to tell us how to treat it. And by default, we treat it as a totally private issue, unless they're willing to step out and say, you know, I want you to use this event. And some of them have, but that's why. Okay, I appreciate your answer. And if we can just kind of think of a way to report out more detail, that would be yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. John. Yes, um, yeah, Michelle. Just to ask John, too many Johns, John Halsey. Um, Scrubbing the data, I understand that obviously they can't release any HIPAA-related information, but uh, if they have the number of deaths in the last 15, 17 years, yes. and they have uh, the uh, year of death, um, they could, it wouldn't, doesn't take that much more, you don't have to do any scrubbing to simply give a graph or a figure of how many deaths occurred in this year versus the next year so versus the following year. To, except so that, that we can see a trend. Except that what's you know what's happening is the state would put out one set of doc one set set of information, and because in Reading mm. we're doing more right. to find out and to ultimately report, yeah. you know, in, in as an open way as possible. They don't match necessarily, so there's got to be the scrubbing is really about building the explanation process of here's a here's a set of information that comes out maybe from a state board of health or from the state you know itself or from the attorney general's office. They're coming from a lot of different places, and so I think what we're trying to do is take the information that we have gathered here locally because of the way that we're aggressively doing our best to gather the information and try to act either on it or at least you know provide it at a certain point you know i think what is going on right at the moment is an effort to try to have an explanation for why this doesn't match this one and this one. I mean, that's the impression. Bob, you, you come to these committee yeah. meetings as I do as well, um, so. Yeah, the, the other wrinkle is sort of back to that, if you will, the family privacy kind of approach. Uh, medical examiners and physicians also have different approaches. Correct. One ME is going to write it up this way. Another ME, for whatever their reason, is going to write up a different way. So it's actually fairly research intense to narrow oh, yeah. down what is really oh, an sure. opioid or a substance abuse-related death. It would be awfully nice if there were rules and everyone just followed them, but there aren't. Right. But and there are more deaths beyond, I mean, the opiate um, crisis literally is, is the largest cause, but there are, you know, the purview of what our cost is trying to work on is substance. 
and, and there are more and, it, and it, you get into that try to sort out what the what a medical examiner is going to say yeah. is not and the easiest thing to do and maybe our casa needs to see you more often um, you remember the presentation she did I think it was last January you know, it was longer than any of us expected but it was necessary yeah. because it was she only was eye -opening. Yeah, it was exactly. well over half the meeting see you know John and I go to these meetings generally once a month or so so they're a little less surprising to us but I totally understand that there's just a lack of information uh, out in the community and maybe that's one of the topics the selectmen's meetings are probably the best form for that honestly unless we develop a new one. well the, the natural the recording feature of what yeah. goes on here for somebody that can't watch it or be here yeah. they know that there's all of these meetings are available right. you know through the YouTube well, plus channel. the questions that come out and I <coughs> presume the material on the screen is now broadcast directly on the screen so they've got some fidelity in what's been shown so there's some value in that conversation I agree with you John and it's again it's a uh, you know, very much a school issue. The schools are very involved in this discussion. Um, so it can be a school committee selectman type of event. I, I don't, I th think that the uh, scrubbing of the data and reviewing the death certificates may be a QAQC question as far as explaining the difference between what our CASA reports for Reading and versus what DPH, for example, reports for Reading it's so you're compl comparing apples and oranges. I think everyone understands that. They don't, DPH doesn't record uh, opiate deaths the same way our CASA is digging into right. every death, certi death certificate. So, so as long as yeah, when she's reviewed the death certificate and, and interpreted the data, she has a date, a, a cause of death, and, and, a, and, uh, and I think that would be helpful for us to know. And I, I would like to I just repeat, I would really liked I know I respect what our cost uh, does I, I I know Erica rather well and and I've gone to some of her, her events they're fantastic I think the 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 size of the problem and the depth of the problem causes maybe for uh, it may be a cause for us to step up our game a little bit and and in, in, you know start to get more coordination between the Board of Health, the police. I know other, some other cities and towns have started thinking outside of the box to address the problem. It's a big problem. Vanessa, do you have a question? Yes. Um, building on what Michelle Sampson said regarding the loss of staff, what efforts are being taken to address the, the recent departure of the Department of Health? Um, um, we are right now fully staffed with North Reading's Health on a temporary basis. Meeting with their town manager on Thursday, and that's one of the topics is whether we want to formalize an IMA or not. Um, we have been borrowing, if you will, um, their health agent while we had a vacancy. We're still borrowing. <coughs> um, so we have all the functions covered. Maybe not with a full time name that's a Reading employee, but we're all set. But that's not a good long term solution. It just works for now. We're still working out a solution over the next couple weeks. Are there other departments? Um, there was a health inspector that retired, and there was a public health nurse that left rather quickly with one hour's notice. So we're sharing, um, or plan to share, I shouldn't say sharing yet, a public health nurse with uh, North Reading for a short period of time, and then figuring out what to do. <coughs> We've got the inspections totally covered, so that's not a problem. So there's not a gap. I mean, there's no gap, if you will, in coverage. Now, I will say that when you're sharing employees in public health, as we've learned, if North Reading and Reading both has the same issue, one would think the North Reading employees might be a little more interested in taking care of North Reading. So we, we understand the risks, um, and that's why we're having the discussion. So Tom, is that where so we're, we're going with this? Is more, um, I don't think so. I, I, I think, again, to the point of depth, it's good. So I do want to have some sort of relationship with North Reading, whether it's formal or informal, I really don't care. I think they might want formal. Um, their, their health uh, director has been absolutely phenomenally helpful for us over the last six months since our health agent left in January rather quickly. Um, not only is he filled in for the job, he's explained to us the role of what a health division should be in his estimate. So we've got a lot more depth in planning um, and thinking. And, well, I'm not sure all of this, because I know a lot of it's been discussed with the Board of Health, and I haven't been to a meeting in a long time. But 
terms of the staff issues, there's not a there's not a coverage gap there at all. There okay. may not be a long-term solution in place yet, though. Any other comments from the public? Okay, we want to move to the. Um, Actually, John, one thing before, sure. we, before we do that. So, um, get it back on the screen again. Last year, we sort of organized, I mean, we organized around those five oh, yeah. broad goals. Right, the headings. And um, sort of assigned, you know, each, each one of the five of us sort of, you know, worked with the uh, appropriate town staff and, and, and not to be the liaison to, but participant in those things. Do we want to think through that again? Uh, I'm okay with that. The, the role that was played last year was mostly as a representative of the board attending the meetings. The staff were doing the real heavy lifting. Um, I guess we could do it two ways. We could ask the town manager to, to make his own suggestions, or if you have a preference, you could submit it to the town manager. We'll arbitrate. Um, no, which is, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, uh, a proposed way of doing it, but I just thought that, um, you know, for example, I, I participated in the planning group that went to all the meetings and, and, and you know, obviously I didn't do all the work, but participated in, you know, from a board level. I, I, I'm assuming we're going to want to just keep that same model, maybe switch it around a little bit. How does the rest of the board feel? John? Well, I mean, you know, I, coincidentally I had finance and I was the chair of the board, which caused Bob and I to be highly interactive um, and it, you know, and it was good. Um, I. It strikes me that if each of us have a separate role, um, it, in, it improves the integration between staff and, and, and I think that's something that Bob is gonna be able to evaluate who's gonna work best with the team that he's got lined up staff-wise because the staff really drive, they drive this. I mean, that, you know. Look great on paper. Five topics, five selectmen. What could be better? Um, and it worked better in some areas than others by design. If you look at operations, you have a liaison to DPW. You have a liaison to the finance committee. The different people. You, you may or may not have a liaison to the facilities department for the security study. I don't know what the best approach is. Um, I think all 25 of these ought to have a name, one of your names on them, but I'm not sure that every five in a group belong to one of you. Yeah. Put it that way. Um, that's something I can talk to staff about a little bit and see what they're... That's a good Jean option. had a question for me today. Um, I honestly don't remember, but she said, can you ask Barry if he would be the liaison for this, and I'll figure it out. And you made a great deal of sense. It was some sort of a, a group of people to look at planning exercise. I think it was place, creative placement. But that's the only reason I wouldn't automatically slap one name on the five, is because it might be that. Your judgment, though, as to which name fits yeah. on the 25, they don't have to be in bundles of five. I was just going to say, I mean, the, well, that's how we did it last year. I, I, you know, I thought it was helpful, but I mean, I well, agreed. It wasn't, you know. You didn't do all the topics in there, though, for instance. And again, just looking at the first six goals, you know, they're all finance, but one happens to say operations because it's policy. Yeah, I, I'll, I, I'll come up with a list and you guys see yeah. what you think. All right. I, I can, I know to John's point, um, like if you put me in any one of those categories, some I may, have, I may be, to be able to do somewhat well or at least cover somewhat well and some what I would just not be well suited to. I, I'm a policy wonk at work, so I do, I do policy. But that's, they're spread out through so I'll, I'll, I'm not going to be here next meeting, two weeks, and so I'll just send you guys my, what I, I think. What I'll do is I'll send you all an email and include Dan uh, with a list and asking for your preferences. You know, yep. there are sure. lists, as many as you want out of the 25 that you'd like to be involved with. That seems like a good start. And then uh, sort of figure it out from there. All right. Good. Well, I kind of put, you know, if our name is on it, we own it. Um, I think that's important. As well as operational. Yeah, I had it set up the same way to start, and then I wasn't so sure that was the best solution. Okay. You want to move to the evaluation process? Sure. Yeah, last year you agreed, or that board agreed, to use the same 
form of evaluation we use for every employee of the town side, which I think is fair to do. So I included last year's um, review that you did sometime in the fall of May. Um, how you want to integrate goals into that, I don't know. <coughs> um, it's really up to you. I would say, again, from the process you've gone through for a couple of times, the conversation is the valuable part, not what it says on a piece of paper necessarily or what the number is or a score or a letter grade. Um, but it's also a conversation that shouldn't happen once a year. It's like any good situation, it should be ongoing. I shouldn't say, what do you mean you, do, you don't like this? Why didn't you tell me six months ago I had to stop doing it? So for us um, on the town side, different departments and then different divisions within departments use the evaluation tool very differently. Um, some use it very minimally. Some use it very detailed. And I'm not going to give you any more than that, but I will tell you it's not obvious from the groups who would do and be doing what. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they don't use the evaluation tool as well as they could to not mean they don't do a good job. They just don't choose to use that as a tool. So uh, what I've discussed in the past and what I've told you, I'll, I'll repeat, I think it's your feedback that's helpful and that should always happen. Well, the one thing is that, I mean, I did like the format of the evaluation. I think I've done two now, maybe? I think so. Um, but the other thing is that every quarter you do bring back those goals. So it's not like we are, we're not talking about it once a year. We, you know, we are going back and, you know, you put in your percentages of completion and you might haggle over whether it's a 50 or a 40, but, but it's really not even that as much as the, the detail that goes into what we accomplished, what we didn't get to. Um, and those are being, those are revisited all the time, which I, I, I think is a, I think is a helpful. And sometimes we'd have to, you know, we have to maybe change direction and paddle in a different way because something else came up. Yeah. So, I, I mean, my feedback is, I like the form. Basically, you know, you're doing a lot of self-evaluation, which I think is important in any type of a, um, evaluation process. And we weigh in um, pretty. It, it, it's a pre it was a pretty open. It wasn't prescriptive. It wasn't a check the box thing. Um, you know, if you read through our evaluations, they were they went in a lot of different directions. Yeah. And I think that that's where the value is. is kind of uh, when you, you know when you read the read the pros as opposed to checking the boxes. Yeah, honestly, I know it's a difficult thing, but I would ask for more. You know, if you're doing it once a year, do as much as you can, as much as you want. You can do it verbally if you'd rather. I don't care. But more feedback's better than less. But generally, if one of the five of us are upset, we pick up the phone. That's fine. I, I would imagine that we do, right? <laughs> I've noticed a pattern, actually. <laughs> I, you know, as far as more feedback is concerned, I talked with a number of people in private industry and this is only something that would work if it would be helpful to you the 360. Bob, the, three, the 360 and the just yeah. the idea is it, it, it allows managers to be conscious of their strengths and areas of improvement um, by looking at it through several perspectives and that is the 360 people who report to you people who you report to and it's not used as a as a wet noodle to beat you over the head with, but rather um, to um, let you know what other people think are your strengths. And, yeah. and because we don't tend to always uh, evaluate ourselves like everybody else does, it would just be more an informational tool f for you. There are uh, drawbacks to them, they have to be done simply anonymously so I just put this in the packet for something you consider and um, if the you know and, and if the board likes it it would be it's a it can't take much time it'd have to be a one page thing and you can look at it and say oh 70% 70, 70 of the people think I do this often or frequently or something like that I don't know. is that something that reappears back to us once completed to the process. It's up to the process. I will tell you that a prior board and a prior town manager, he brought this to them. I think it was ICMA, I don't think it was MMA, but it was some effort professionally to do 360s. Yeah. And so we, he talked about it with Selectman one night. And we were a little surprised. Um, he was more of a top-down manager than me, let's just say. 
And then he talked to all the department heads and said, I really like your honest feedback. And then we never did it. So I don't know what happened. I don't know why it didn't happen. Um, maybe he started getting the honest feedback and said, well, that's enough of that. I have no idea. This is one, of the, one of the dis things we discussed, though, was one honest feedback. But the power of anonymity can be a big negative in an organization. So I don't know how you solve that. Yeah, I mean, they d the articles that I, I printed out address that. And um, again, it has to be clear up front that uh, they don't say this, but it's not used as a, a wet noodle uh, approach. Um, but, you know. Well, I mean, we see all the time the perceived anonymity of social media unleashes unleashes the beast um, and I don't know and that's okay I mean it's America you can say whatever you want to say it's fine it's a little bit but I don't know that that's yeah, necessarily setting. productive to this exercise but you know I, it, I think the concept is that you know it helps you you know great leaders or good leaders um, will inspire confidence um, in, in the employees and, and if that's not happening take a look at yourself and say, is there anything I want to change? Maybe not. I don't know. Just a, it's a it's an opportunity for, I think they say, growth in a job. Well, I think that's something, Bob, if you decide that that's something that would be valuable to you I'll to better you. do your job, I'll that's one thing. I think the idea you. of incorporating it into what we use yeah. in our evaluation of your interaction with us is is not necessarily, I mean, I don't, I don't see that coming into what well, we would do with Bob. If instance, Bob chooses to do I did an evaluation for, of Sharon as her manager, even though I don't hire her, you do. I would never share that evaluation with you, ever. That's a private document. Yes. If I had to do it in public, it would be different. That's all. Not materially different, but um, so there's the public private wall that exists. Yeah. I think the 360 idea, I hadn't thought about it until you sent me that article since Peter talked about it on an HR wonk. Um, I like the idea of getting feedback from department heads. I don't know the best method to get it, and I'm not sure if the feedback I would get privately would be the same as you would get publicly. And well, I would prefer to have the more honest part, which is probably the private part. Yes. So I'll ask the department heads if they want to go off in a corner and talk about it themselves, and they would find some value in doing either individual, same form, rank me each, or one of you do a summary and put it all together, see what they want to do, see what they think. Cause they I think the that's position. a call that you make, and I think it has to be, I personally think it needs to be separate from what we do, because everything we do with Bob is in the public. And that's fine, I, you know. I and I think it's appropriate because we are the technically the people that hire you, um, and therefore, and we're hired by the people, and therefore, that process should remain completely transparent, completely wide open. Yeah, assuming this, the department heads would do this and do an honest job, I would personally be fascinated by how they would differ from you on the same set of facts. The trouble with this is we live in different worlds. We, yeah. we see you, you know, four hours once every, right. one, twice a month. They are there uh, on full-time employees and much more interactive. This is more useful. I've seen this used principally with new managers coming into their first supervisory role where they get feedback from their new directs, feedback from their, um, their, their superiors, and they can kind of figure out where they are in their growth pattern as they kind of take off into a more supervisory role. I'm not seeing it used at senior levels of organizations because, frankly, the things that got people to where they are in their careers are usually their strengths. And more often than not, those strengths end up being weaknesses in different settings. You know, somebody who's a good authoritarian works great when you need authority, but other settings, it's a, it's a weakness. So you kind of get weird feedback which says, you know, you really got to solve this authoritarian problem. Yeah, but I'm the CEO. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's that kind of weird feedback. It's not actionable. But somebody who's kind of just starting off, you can kind of get this uh, perspective more broadly about people that how, how am I doing as a boss and how am I doing as, as reporting out. 
That's why I think in your own organization this might be interesting. It's it's kind of bottoms up, but it might be. If interesting. it was honest, it would be interesting. If it wasn't honest, it would be pointless. And that's correct. I like to think that we all of us have a good honest relationship with every department head right now. Mm. Um, so I'm I'm pretty sure it'd be an honest evaluation in private. Right. I don't think they would say the same things to you. Better or worse. I think I you're right. They're, and they're not. The questions are: <coughs> Are you a are you a dictator or are you a, a state post marshmallow? I mean, they're more uh, leadership based or managerial based things that are somewhat not innocuous but non judgmental and just yeah, style. I I see this in this person frequently. Oh, that's a strength of mine. I see this in this person less frequently. Anyway, I, you can read them. And, I'll, I'll talk this Thursday with the department of meeting. It does bring to mind one, the only surprise I had in my last evaluation, which isn't bad, there's only one, was a, t a topic, I think it was called change management. And I think four of you said I did whatever the middle category was and one said good. And um, I got some rather loud feedback from some department heads saying, do the selectmen pay any attention? I said, wait a minute. They're pretty much all private sector guys. When they want to change something, they just change it. It's not right. a big deal. Right. They don't understand how difficult it is to change something. Right. So that grade is totally fair based on where they're coming from. It's perspective. Yeah. It's perspective. Um, but that's another thing where you have to understand the audience on both sides to understand the evaluation. I could imagine in a civic setting, this is the, change, the rate of change we're experiencing is revolutionary. You don't see this yeah. in most it is. municipal organizations. Yeah. And I. Personally, I like it. I like that kind of rapid, agile approach. Any other questions before we move on? Um, so what's the timeline on this? It's doing? up to you. It's your process. Um, I think last year, did uh, you have Dan or something appointed as the data yes. gatherer? Right. Dan collected the data, assembled it nice. into. That'd be another good thing. Okay. Yeah, at least he's not here to point so Dan tonight. Point him again. That's it. Be sick of that. You tell me what you need, and you know, honestly. It, I want to find some way to get department head feedback into you. I just don't know the right way. You deserve to have that, even if it's not on camera. So. Okay. Yeah, because the thing is, we don't, we don't, we see you we in this, see and, and we see you in this, we don't see you. Not in the heat of battle, right? Right, right. exactly. And, and that's, and, and, and we don't, as part of our process, we don't interview uh, department heads. Hey, how's Bob, how's Bob doing? Right. You know, is that our role? I don't think so. It's not our job. Most of them would be very uncomfortable if you asked that question, yeah, honestly. That. But still, but it's, it's, nice it's legit. Know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, it's a legit question, but you're right. You, you don't want to yeah. put a spot. So why is that a legit question? Yeah. I don't think that's a legit question at all. I think because uh, we hire him, he hires you them. To, you need to make the evaluation yourselves, right. and you use whatever information and tools you have. Correct. So those those that are available to us are the ones that we would use. I mean, the idea, uh, I mean, when you hire an executive director, um, that's, who the, that's who manages the staff. And you, get, you gauge based on results and inputs, and did you get what you expected? If you start asking the second, third level, one, you don't know what to do with the data. Two, I guarantee you somebody in there, somebody's going to throw a ringer at you. What do you do with that data? Well, but you, I think you anticipate there may always be a ring. But what are you going to do with the data? What and will then, you do with the data? Well, we, we use our judgment. And I think that it's, a, I think it's in, important in every institution to understand how the entire organization views itself. It goes to morale. It goes to productivity. It goes, yes, I mean, there are endpoint results that we can point to and say, we accomplished these 25 goals this year. Um, but is it possible to accomplish more? Or you know, are we accomplishing it in an efficient manner as can be? Just, it's just I mean, a, I mean, you know, you, right, you look at the 25 goals, yep, we hit those, those are good. And, but if everyone who works in the town government thinks the town manager is an SOB. Exactly. That obviously has implications that, you know, we're looking at, well, did the, did the work get done? I'm not saying it's, well, we do anything with that, but I'm it's, just it's responding it's to the thought to that we would reach out or, or no. I'm not suggesting yeah. that we do that, but I, I, I mean, but it would be nice to see the feedback. Ourselves. I'm just getting some water, John. I had to hobble over. No, no, I'm not. I'm not helpless. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Um, because when I evaluate department heads, I don't ask anyone else's opinion. <coughs> 
at all. I work with them, that's my responsibility. Um, I would never ask any subordinate to evaluate there. I, I think to... But that doesn't, that doesn't, that's just me. I just want to do it. It doesn't mean it's wrong. I do the same thing. I figure that's my responsibility to understand how good a job X is doing, and I have to, I'm never going to know all the things. And by the way, I also ask them to fill out some stuff to help me. Um, you know, we'll have, usually they each get about five goals. Um, and I'll be familiar with maybe three or four. And I'll, I'll look at the fifth one and go, I don't even remember I gave you that. What have you done? And so it's helpful, so there's a back and forth um, exchange. But otherwise, it's my responsibility to then gather all the information that I didn't know and make a judgment. And I do. And, you know, we talk about it. Again, it's the discussion well, that's the valuable part. The exercise of taking those 25 yeah. and assigning them not in blocks but to us will give us, I think, much more insight than an interview process with Bob's subordinates. I think that would be a highly inappropriate thing to do. Okay. Anything else on this topic? No, I'll, I'll come back to you with what I hear out of department heads. I'll trust their judgment. Okay. All right. Should we move on? Next on the agenda is um, each of us responded to a, uh, a survey that uh, Barry had generated. I had um, taken a few efforts to uh, the flow, and uh, each of you had your own comments, and I think a version of it is in tonight's packet. Yeah, and just so you know, I have everyone's originals, so I, if you want to go back to your uh, original I think this is, comments, I can do that. It's a slide uh, 189 in tonight's packet. Yeah. So I guess the subject matter for tonight is, are we ready to go live with this? Or is it, does anyone have any, any um, further comments that you think without which this is a Italy injured Bob. I want to answer, I don't remember honestly, I think it was Barry, that I don't know what technology tools we have. I know Recreation has used SurveyMonkey. I know I've used something else through our website. Fairly certain we're going to use some product that does cross tabulations. Okay. That was, it would uh, not be a good outcome if we couldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, that I don't was, know the details. Any other comments by members of the board on the way it's constructed here? There are two extra questions that Bob had nominated. Um, and Bob, thank you for modifying question eight because all of us stopped at 65. And yeah. <laughs> I think and one of you, maybe Dan suggested that. Yeah, and, and of course the discussion we had on uh, aging and, and reading uh, makes us very aware that there are a couple of brackets above that. Um, so if there are no other comments, I'll, I'll I, take I actually just, yeah. I, I mean, if there's any way to get this in one page, probably it may not matter if it's a survey monkey. Um, but I could someone help me understand the difference between five and six? I think five is saying, as you sit here today, Mr. Survey Taker, yeah, um, be aware that Reading compares itself to 25 other peer communities. As you sit here today, what do you think Reading's annual tax bill compared to one of the uh, what, what are the other communities relative to Reading's tax bill is? You may not know which is F. Right. But if you do know, what would you, or you would like to care to guess? We just have an opinion or an sense. opinion. What would you think? And how does that help us? Go ahead. Because the reason for that question is, I ran into so many people through the last override discussion mm -hmm. that believe the tax bills in Reading were astronomically high compared to the other towns. I didn't like the answer. We're not going <laughs> to say the answer. Yeah. But I said, okay, that's nothing wrong with having that opinion. You right. Just need so to know more uh, okay. Yeah, because I, I think if it's a, it's a, we did, yeah. you know. Very we clever, added this very cleverly added, yeah, done because yeah. it's sort of like and especially if we have the ability to cross tabulate there that's, may be somebody that says key. well i think our tax bill is x amount of dollars yeah. higher therefore i will only support a tax bill of x minus higher on an overall. it tells you you have an information problem where people right. say hell no and yet they say you know but based on information that that may not be factual. correct correct that's actually a very clever question. Yeah, I, I, that was <coughs> nice now. Thanks. I, I don't know that I may not need to word it so it makes more sense. It seems like a lot of clumsy words. Uh, maybe, but the concept is sound. Okay. Um, and then um, six is simply to establish kind of the appetite for, that, yeah. for change. That I got. I just, I, I, it was the combo. Yeah. Actually, uh, just yes, on, on 7D, 
Um, I would make a minor change. Um, I would say I had children at, at, at 10 at Reading Public School, but not at 10 today. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I agree. They may not have graduated. Right. That would, I mean, they may have moved off to somewhere else yeah. or gone to. And I have a question about 2A, A. subpart A. Maybe we're going to change the subpart, but 2A, if you voted yes, please circle all that apply. Um, R, let me see, A and B equivalent to C and D. My thinking was, oh, yeah. and I think I had this discussion with maybe Dan. Yeah. Um, the override was October. Mm -hmm. Got that right? Yeah. So as you walked into the booth, mm -hmm. there was already some cuts that had happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Concern is that why you voted? Oh, you it's rearward looking versus <coughs> forward looking. And then, okay, C and D are. I was more worried about what you were going to do uh, as of October. So, you could conceivably circle all four. Uh, so, today you wouldn't have a need to ask four questions, you just say, What are you worried about? Right, right. Would changing recent to simply past maybe be be or past and future so that the context previous? Well, yeah, but well, proposed is, as you say, is looking forward. Well, future. back in October was looking forward. Past and future, right? Yeah. Past well, cuts to town budget. No, I, my sense was A and B were histor historical. Right. And C and D were in the future. Right. So if so you said. It's just got to be a better way to say that because recent now does feel like what yeah. happened. Maybe right. historical right. or past. Why don't you say historical and future? Historical cuts, historical cuts, future cuts, future cuts. Good catch, Andy. Yeah, it is. Oops. Uh -oh. There's a science to this, picking the right words, mm -hmm. too. Right. I'll but do that Mr. For Chair, I'm, I'm happy to pull the trigger on this whenever. Um, Any other, um, what, was the, what was the comment we just made a moment ago about? Um, <coughs> I have a question, but I gotta eight. remember it. Yeah, 7D, you were gonna edit that as well. This was um, this was published in many locations, and I think highly appropriately um, in social media today. Okay. Yeah. And the urging was that if people from the public had an interest in giving some input, and I think we should call for that. We will. I just, to, I just want to get our comments in here. We'll go to public here in a minute. Any other comments from the board? Seven uh, Seven D was the was the graduate question. Oh, you already got it. Good. Okay. Any other comments from the board? If not, <coughs> comments from the public. Yes. Hi, Karen Gaffin, 15 Hill Lock Road. Um, forgive me, I have a few questions. Sure. Uh, first one was, um, was anyone from the school committee, I know it came up at your joint meeting that uh, they were hoping to see a copy of this. Ultimately, did that happen? Were they consulted about this? Um, I didn't involve the schools. The, I don't know, Bob, if you've had any discussions with John on this no they would have seen this information just as it's, as they normally would any selectman but I didn't go out of my way to say here's a survey what do you think this is strictly on the override question uh, itself which is um, in our purview um, this is not the last survey though this will probably run for a term and then we'll have a, a second attempt or second <coughs> effort to generate a follow-up survey most likely in the fall okay. so uh, it'd be perfectly reasonable to take the results of the first one, use that to inform our second one as it relates to feedback we might get from this. Um, so that leads me to another question is, what is your plan for the results from this? Is it something that you would share publicly? I think so. Once it's, we have a statistically enough survey result, if you have a few dozen, it really doesn't tell you very much. But if you had hundreds, I think it starts to trend in the right direction. I would imagine at a meeting like this, we present the data in some reasonable form, cross-tabulated, so you can see if you answered yes to why for one, you got something else for two. Yes. So do you have a baseline number in mind that you're hoping for response? I don't think we thought that far ahead, that we've spent more time trying to get this written in a way that's easy to understand and you're done in 10 minutes 
and we'll see what we get. We're kind of, this is our first attempt, so okay. we didn't want to overthink the process. Um, so related to that, um, at first glance, some of the responses could be perceived as leading. If, are you doing, like, why not leave them open-ended? Are you doing that so that it's faster for people to reply to, or Aaron, why, not, you, why you... not just say, if you voted yes, why? If you well, voted actually, no, why? Uh, Funny, that's why I like Kath, that's how my response was, and Larry felt strongly we should give him a couple of hints to at least start well, the conversation. Well, some of the things that we kind of heard, but, but if you notice, yeah. all of the other questions sort of leave an other and gives yeah. people a chance to, you know, to do it. I mean, we tried to, at least when I, when I wrote it, I tried to and I think it's not, not sort of um, kind of lead people by the nose on what to say, but these are the things that we heard. I mean, just... Yeah. We've heard these before, so if, if they're major categories, if we can, they can at least click A, You've got 50% of the folks that have that opinion, and the other is there if they don't. You can go either way on this, but if they're all others, we got to read them all and categorize them ourselves. And so, not having at least some granularity and makes actually, it hard to when tabulate. I, when I first wrote it, I, I, I put some of those things, I sort of say rank them. Right. What was number most one, important. number two, number three. And, and, I, and I just think that, you know, when we talked about it, it was kind of like, well, let's just find out. Give me your top ones. Okay. Anything else? Um, yes. So, um, look at number six, where you're asking people for their applicant pronoun. I, I understand why you're interested in that information. How much do you think that will actually inform your decision? Though? I mean, well, I imagine there's at least a certain amount that you would have to put forth in order for this to last a few years. So, I think the stimulus behind that was last year, the last override, the impact to the average tax bill was 1100 1150 Ballpark 1000 with yeah. senior tax relief. It was over 1000 Yeah, it was over 1000 yeah. So the thought here is, is the appetite in the main, in, in the average, is it substantially different? Obviously, folks said no strongly that 1000 1100 with senior tax relief included um, was a no. I'm just curious if appetite has changed here. That's all. We have no idea. This is not a leading question. It's literally, how do you think now in 2017 with another year under your belt? And it was very interesting. I mean, um, to the year before we proposed the override, um, Dan made the state of the um, right. town, and he used the voting right. tool that we have. And that voting tool was, the sampling group was the was town people. meeting. Town meeting. Yeah. Um, and the number that they, it was he, he articulated in percentage rather than, right. um, and it was very interesting. Those things lined up in a very similar way, percentage wise compared to what those numbers are. Yeah. Um, and the number was in the CD area, or the choice of the town meeting was in the CD area. Um, frankly and from my perspective having seen that and had that information when we looked at the proposals for the last override uh, my strong recommendation was that we take at least a million dollars out of it um, maybe more so that we could get down into a range that the test group had shown us you know might be now it, it, it came down some but it obviously didn't come down enough so I think there's a value to this thing. People may tell you if we get a big enough cross sampling, which is always the test. And I'd add to that that um, when we had the um, elder services group in here a few weeks ago, I was astounded to see the number of Reading residents that are retired elderly in their homes. It was 30% or 65 and older, and the demographics likely to grow. Many of those people I don't think were necessarily in town meeting. They may be underrepresented. So that's actually an attempt to sample that here, is if you take a broader sample, how much of the folks that are either on fixed incomes or post full-time employment have a different view than, say, the 192 that were in uh, town meeting? Sure. Um, so that leads me to my final question. How are you planning on distributing this so that you do ensure you get a wide cross-section in town? I think the thought is a couple of ways. One is to do it on the web through this survey monkey or similar. I think we could do it on paper to the extent folks are more comfortable there. I mean, if it's a small number, we could do through elder services. Those could be manually tabulated. There's no identifying information on this, so 
and those could then be manually entered by somebody else into Survey Monkey, so we can still tabulate them correctly. I don't know if you had well, any other have, ideas. Yeah, we can have you know the uh, um, the staff at the senior center you know set up a couple of monitors so people can yeah. come and do them themselves. With some guidance and training. Right. So. Right, the idea is that I, I'd like to see it done really all electronically, only so that you don't have like all star balloting where you vote twenty five times for Mookie Betts. I mean, you want you want it to be. You know, you want it to be statistically relevant. I mean, it's not—it's not a statistical poll, but at least to have enough. You don't want people voting 25 times and skew the results. Has a mechanism, right? Yeah. It doesn't let you. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't you, let you, you, you do a yeah. So doing it electronically is probably better than. I think when the library did theirs, I think it was a paper ballot. Uh, I remember. Go, I remember filling mine out at like a town day. No, I will they tell you. They had a lot of results. Paper too. ballots are a lot of work for staff then. Yeah, oh, you got to gather. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you got to Someone's got to tabulate them. And especially with these, I mean, where we're, the value of this survey is not so much how many people would vote yes if it was $500 or how many people um, who are over 65 would vote yes. I mean, you're getting the sort of the cross tabs to sort of figure out where, where certain people, where people are. Um, you know, and I think that that's valuable. Because that helps sort of us structure what's what's the right what, what's the right thing. We don't want to put something up that's not going to pass, but to structure it in a way that kind of um, I'm, I'm not saying myself personally. I'm not saying I'd be governed 100% by the results of this survey. I'd be certainly guided by it, not necessarily governed by it. Because sometimes the right thing to do is is to me you know maybe do something that you know some folks have to kind of straighten the collar a little bit, but. But it is still the right thing to do. So that's how I look at the value. It may also be a thing that it may also be a tool once the once the data is collected that helps you understand how to get the message out, yes, which is so. really, in my opinion, this is more valuable as a tool in that direction mm -hmm. than it is telling me, you know, what so number I, I of, yeah. endorse and vote for. Frankly. This kind of information, if we get uh, one of the best, one of the one of the, one of the best done surveys, community surveys that I've seen in recent memory, was about the Birch Meadow project, and the return wa it was abutting neighbors. Um, the return was about three percent, which is a staggering number, um, in a relative. And if we could get to 1% with this, we've got 18,000 voters. Um, if we could get to 1%, it would tell us a lot about how to present this on the other end, whatever the number is. Um, so I, that's the way I see this thing. The, uh, I mean, that question eight is really important. Bob? Yeah, I think the real power and the value of the survey is not an answer to any of the questions. It's all the interrelationships yes. between the issues at it and say, oh, look at this. The so-and-sos that did this before are now thinking this. It's just an education for all of us. Um, as, as, as has been said, it's difficult to communicate with people in this day and age. There's so many different ways. Um, this is tremendous feedback that people can give to the board. Even though it seems like 10 simple questions, the intricacy of how they're linked is really helpful. I Particularly, think. like, as it, as it opens up in question one, the question is, how did you do it before, and what would you do differently now? And what would drive you there? That's probably the most interesting what piece of data What do you need us. to get from A to B? And yeah. it's only one tool. I mean, you know, yeah. Dan has brought up on a, a number of occasions, and I really think he's right. Oh, yeah. Um, focus groups of maybe no more than a dozen people from a real cross-section, this will help us drive towards inviting a cross-section of people into these small focus groups. And, you know... I mean, so for example, we could separate in five directions and each do five focus groups over the course of the fall based on the data that we find here. And what you end up with is unbelievable face-to-face -face feedback. This, I think, will help us construct those. So I think this is one tool in the bigger, in the bigger project of awareness and voter opportunity to give input and then as it's already happened the results of this survey the survey itself and the results from it the now amended with the red lettering version anyway 
and the results of it, we hope, will go into social media, and that'll be another wave of awareness. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I do want to be clear. I'm thrilled that you are doing this, and I very much look forward to seeing what kind of response. I know there's been frustration that it hasn't happened sooner. It's taken a while. One, we don't work outside of this meeting. We work through Bob, so there's a time component to it. And two, I'd rather get it right than get it wrong. So, but I appreciate yeah, folks sticking with us. To, so. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much for coming in, Aaron. Yes, Vanessa. You can talk. You can. You have to come up. <laughs> uh, I have several questions, so bear with sure. me. Sure. Um, so, generally speaking, in a survey. It's a hypothetical. It's the of error yeah, I understand. I'm not sure you need 60% for trending. If I've got if I've got 10 or 15%, it's a random collected data. I can still tell where the population is going. I may not have perfectly accurate, but it's directionally correct. Are, are you suggesting that 60% need to respond? She's making the observation that that's. Really it's it's just an observation. So I, I'm curious if if we get a thousand people instead of five thousand or six thousand. Well, let's see. Okay. My my concern is if. Hard to know because we don't know what the data is. I think your point's a valid one. If, if we only get a couple hundred, I think it's largely going to be a disappointment. I'm not sure which, what conclusions you make out if you have a couple hundred. If you have a couple, remember, 6,800 people voted for the override, and that determined the outcome for everyone. So if you got 10%, which would be one third of the 6,800, 10% of the voters, that's yeah, enough yeah. to tell where the, the voting, the bulk when of the they do, When they do the presidential polls, you know, they'll, they'll hold. 600 people in New Hampshire until right, exactly. they win the primary. Right. Now, granted, it's done more scientifically and <laughs> statistically the right six hundred. better than what we're doing. They get paid more we, than we do. But so. if we can get it out there to a large number of people, again, it's kind of, I mean, there'll, there'll be trends that we can, we can tell from this. And the, so, the, the social media part of it, I think, can't be underestimated. This is going to foster a lot of conversation on Facebook, and that conversation alone is going to be useful. It may not tell us much, but I think it's going to get the thought creation and, and, and conversation going. We just got to figure out how to do it for people that don't use computers regularly, the folks that... I thought that's where you were going, is that if we could get this survey available for completion to 60% of the constituents... That's what I thought she meant, too. I, because, honestly, I, I mean, we don't have uh, these surveys... Well, we're no. making sure we reach broad enough audience that we're not right. only doing it if we're only... I mean, no, no, I, I agree with you. So if we... If, if we give, if we're certain that 60% of the voting, the available voters have the opportunity to complete this in right. one form or another, and that's 12,000, and we get 1% of that, if we get 1,200, that, that, is, uh, that is a big home run. I think, we'll, I think we might get more, uh, especially with Alyssa to help. No, I'm friends. just saying, uh, you here. know, is, is, are you... Is one of the points that you're getting at is that if you have a small sample size and that it skews towards younger people, 20 to 35 year olds, we're going to get a different answer than if had it skewed, skewed to, towards the somewhat younger people in, the 50, in their 50s. Although it's cross tabulated, although it's cross tabulated, so we'll be able to figure that out. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. We'd have to. We'd have to take that into account. <coughs> we'll be able to. We'll be able to normalize for age group and normalize for any of these questions. And I think you also have to take some of these things um, with not a grain of salt, but in perspective. For example, if people say I didn't understand what the schools were selling me, it's a lot harder to understand a school budget than it is a town budget. At least it was for me. So, so that's not a black or white answer. It just helps us get a sense for. So, um, so thank you for that. Yep. I, I do have some questions regarding the phrasing of some of these. Sure, go ahead. Survey. Um, my concern is for sub for two A, two B, three, and seven. We separate out the town versus the school. Take this. Uh, and we 
have one budget. We don't have two, and we are one town. My concern is that if we're splitting it, we're divide. It's, it's a divisive point um, because the town, the town budget doesn't function that way. We can't. It splits naturally amongst all of the departments. The town just has the school just happens to be one of them. So are we creating a bias? Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, I mean, there were different versions of this, um, but I think it's important for, for pe there are people, um, to some, some, to some people, you know, the schools are the most important. To other people, the schools are important, but maybe they're concerned about all the services. So I think it was important that we sort of break out, not saying, well, we're only going to fund one versus another, but just to kind of see where people's heads were about what people's concerns were. Are, are they more concerned about some of the town cuts and potential town cuts than they are schools or vice versa? Doesn't mean that we're gonna go in one direction more than another, but again, this is just more information. What are, what are you know, we're, we're trying to basically get inside the heads of the voters. I don't know how that's a part. I could add to that, one of the comments that I know was heard um, during the school budget process was if I had known these were the details, I would have voted. This gives them an opportunity, again, through cross-tabulation to see who voted, who didn't vote, and what do they care about. Again, the, you know, you're trying to learn, you're trying to gather information, you're trying to understand why didn't you vote. And if there's a high number of people who didn't vote and now they're concerned about the schools, you can infer that they're more likely to vote. I mean, I think if that is the point, just to collect information as far as we can specifically to the schools, um, you know, I know that we have mentioned I think it's our intention to get this survey out as soon as possible. I think so. I don't think this is, none of this is meant to be pejorative. This is frankly to understand how the, what the granularity is in the electorate <coughs> and to discover, to John's point, if there's a group that we have to message to, this is going to elicit it and we're going to say, you know, we got a problem over here. Um, let's go address it. Whereas if we do it as one, I don't think you're going to get that granularity. I think you're going to see it in a form that you can act on it. So I don't, none of this is meant to be, um, Disruptive. I'm interested if folks think differently, having now slept on it. Yeah, and Larry, this was one of your ideas. Yeah, and you I still think okay that, with it? Yeah, and I, I think it's really important. If you know, we we know how parents of school age children in town feel about the overlap, right? What I don't really understand are the are, are the folks whose kids graduated from Reading High five years ago and are seven years away from retiring. I don't know how they feel. I want to know how they feel, and I want to know. Um, sort of why they voted the way they did, and if they voted no, why they did, and how we can get them to a yes. That's important information, and it's and you know, in, in any campaign, if you run any political campaign, it, it's the information that you collect that's important, and it helps you kind of tone and, and hone your message, um, and and get information out to people who may uh, may not be getting that. So uh, that's but why. The school committee can't great ally. In I think my take on that would be in the second round where we take this raw data in and say, what do we do with it next? That'd be a great time to fix that. Because that's going to, we're going to have one, evidence that it's a problem, and two, need to involve them. Let's assume for the moment it is a problem. Well, couldn't we avoid the, perhaps, if, if some of the language is biased, we involve the school committee now, couldn't we potentially avoid biased language? So I, mean, I don't think this is biased. In, this, in the same way, way. One at a time. How do we know as a practical involved. matter, the next school committee meeting is the very end of July. So you're going to add at least another month onto this process. Not necessarily. Not if the chairs and vice chairs met. Um, that's not a committee meeting. That's just two people. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, but uh, two things. I mean, part of the value of the survey is letting the people, the people of the town of Reading know that we care about what they think. And that goes a long way in helping an override get past to the extent we need it. And, and I think that um, 
you know, one of the school committee members at the FinCom meeting expressed a desire to sit down and talk about some of the questions. What does it hurt? And then in the end, it's, it's our survey. And you can say, well, we feel strongly about, but at least they've been heard. And then you guys can put out the survey. We can put out the survey. I'm inclined to do something earlier that's imperfect to get early data and worry about the second one being the final, just where my head's at. I, I could see how you could read this differently, but I think we've tried hard not to make it disruptive and more just to elicit where people's heads are at. Bob? And yet, I've, I've specifically said that some of the language, I, as I'm reading it, is biased. Take, take me to an example. Uh, 2A. Let's go back to two. What's the problem with two? As I just mentioned, the fact that we're separating out the town versus the school budget. But there are people who <coughs> have strong feelings about different aspects of their municipal services. Don't you want to know if how people vote, like what they're concerned about, whether they're more concerned about, whether they're concerned about public safety and school? Don't you want to know, don't you want to learn that information? Um, well, but there's many departments. Elder services isn't listed here. Other community services aren't listed here. Um, it, it's very clearly divided into town versus school. That's how the budget is put together, though. Are you worried that this is somehow um, coloring the discussion, or I think or it's lead to the, what, what, it or, or leading to an out, output yeah. that? But you're not asking for priorities. No. In fact, actually, one of the versions we did did that do that. A lot of we were going to circle vote. Not to. Right. Yeah. Um, I, my name is Michelle Sampi. that meeting the other evening and I heard three times it was said that the chair or the vice chair of the school committee was going to have some kind of communication and I was really disappointed. Well, this is the first time this board has seen this version so practically speaking couldn't have had the conversation prior to tonight. This version didn't exist um, in public until the packet came out. So. And it's all over social media. But, That's but not there, in my control. Was a, it, once it's a, out, it's there was a similar survey I, I just I mean I'm perfectly happy leaving it in your and Barry's hands and sitting down with Chuck <coughs> and Elaine and and then and going through it as soon as you can and then get it out I don't want to again I don't want to hold the process up yeah, either I'm fine with that too. I, I, I don't know how to proceed though if there's a disagreement on whether you separate it or not well ultimately because our it's purpose your is survey it's a, it's our survey. Correct. Right? So therefore, you can inform them. But if there's a disagreement, what you, are you going to act on the disagreement or not? If you're not, then it's a courtesy, but it's not. In you have the conversation, and if they don't convince you, they don't convince you. I also can't. Talk, and I, again, I don't speak for the school committee here at all, obviously. Um, but if this is a board of selectmen survey, and yet we want to reach a wide audience, presumably the school committee would help in the dissemination of it. And I don't know. I would not. thought whatsoever to have the school committee disseminate this. It's summer. The thought was to get this out and get some data over the summer that in September would have at least an initial set we could act on and then uh, one, do a revised survey if we needed to based on something that maybe popped up that we didn't understand and two, start to work on our messaging. I don't want to lose the summer. I know it's kind of a soft point but over the three months I think we can do a pretty good job getting reaching adults. 
Um, I hear what you're saying. I'm happy to meet, and Mary, I'm sure you're happy to meet with Gene I'm and Chuck. Happy to sit I just don't know what to do if there's a group disagreement. Well, I mean, at that point, it's a discussion between, given how, how significant the school department this is, um, I mean, at that point, it's between the chairs and the vice chairs to have the yeah. conversation about how best to I, I, I will say, in, in our defense, I don't think there's any attempt to color the discussion. This is purely to figure out for the respondent is your driver one or the other or both, and is it backward looking or forward looking. It's no more scientific than that. Um, and I, I don't mean to imply that it's intentionally biased. I'm saying I just think they should provide input. On a table, this one for now, because yeah. I have other items. All right, go ahead. Uh, so. Actually, before you go on, Vanessa, what does the board want to do? Does the board have an opinion here tonight? So we've heard input from the, from the Public. Not a vote, but just what's your opinion, John? My opinion is that this is a this is not designed as a marketing piece to drive somebody's decision in one direction or another. It's designed to collect information, and I think it's been really well thought through. I, I actually think that I mean I offered a couple of ideas, but I have no pride of authorship in this whatsoever. But I think that. This will collect a lot of information and get to the visceral feeling that, and I think, Barry, that's what you were hoping for. Um, I, and to me, the sooner you have your hands on as much of that information as possible, it allows you to react to that data once collected so that you can proceed with the next step in this process. So to me, you know, um, being, because it's, I mean, the Board of Selectmen have to decide several things. When and where to put a question out, and what the question will be and how much it will be. In order to be able to do that, personally, I want as much information as quickly as possible so that we can not only take that step, but then react in a way that allows us to drive the process towards success. Um, the idea that people who I think, I thought, had a common interest with us in better funding the town in, a, in an appropriate way would want to participate, not, but not boycott. But that's just my thought. I mean, I, I think more information, as visceral as possible, is really valuable at this step in the in the. In the in the process, just to amplify that, you triggered a thought. I do think we may we reserve the right to ask difficult questions that may be viewed as um, differently by different people. Because to John's point, if we got to know it, I'm not I'm not going to fail to ask a question and be ignorant as a result. We don't we can't we got to get this right. And if something pops out of this that deserves more inquiry, and that leads to a second set of questions, if the data is more important. We got to be polite. We got to be prescriptive. We got to be accurate. We got to make sure we don't have any intent, unintended consequences. But we we got to also reserve the right to ask hard questions if they've got to be asked. I don't think any of these here are that. They weren't intended as that. But if if truly a hard question came up, like, gee, in our September in our um, summer survey, 60% of the population said they didn't want to fund the town. We might come up with a second survey that tried to put some more, you know, tease out of that why. And there might be some hard questions in there. Is it, you know, is there a problem with the police? Is there a problem with the fire? Is there a problem with elder services you don't like? I'm, I'm making this up. These are all hypotheticals. I imagine that would be viewed as very negative, but those sorts of questions would have to get our heads around before we ask for another override, because you're, there's something out there we don't see and we don't understand. And exactly my reason. You guys are okay with the edits we've made tonight in the final version. I'm happy. Mary, we'll find some time with Gene. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Lane and. Uh, yeah. I, I have Chuck. one more. Sure, go ahead. Hey, could I just weigh in? Sure. Really I'm quick. I'm sorry, we didn't go around the table. Are, are you okay? Or? No, I don't find. I'm, I'm just. I'm, I'm scratching my head here. I'm trying to. I'm going through these questions and I'm trying to find out what, what about these questions are so 
you know, leading in one direction or another, you know, again, to, you know, uh, we've been asked to do this and get things going and move the schedule up to leave time to campaign for an override. Um, and so this is the information that we need to kind of move this forward. So, um, but again, I'm, I'm happy to talk to, yeah. to Gene and to, uh, and to Chuck. And get their thoughts on this, but since I wrote most of this, I can honestly tell you, it's for information gathering, not to lead people in one direction or another. And you know, I think part of maybe what we didn't understand the last time is that maybe we didn't ask enough of, of these questions. So um, you know, we have one more chance to get this right. So and I, and I should state that I'm not opposed. Again, I and, and none of us are professional yep, 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 yep. So I get it. The more thoughts we collect on this, we might be able to change slight wording that have a positive yeah. effect. Um, I did have one, one more Vanessa. So, 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 so I feel a little bit of like the I think it's the father and fiddle out of the roof on the one hand. On the on, you know to Vanessa's point, I, I we, you know, we don't have a choice between how we split our town school budget. So you know, it's it's one budget, it's one override. Why are we differentiating? On the other hand, it's good to know if there is a uh, if we could communicate better and justify better spending on the town side or spending on the school side. If people aren't understanding why we're spending why we're spending this amount of money on the school side, we need to do a better job as to the school committee. We all need to do a better job. Uh, 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 it informs how we inform the community and how we go from there. On the other hand, involving the school committee would allow us to, as you suggested, to dig down deeper into, okay, they weren't pleased with, say, the municipal side. What is it they weren't pleased with? And where do we need to ask some harder questions? We can't do that on the school side. That's not our, so that would be a benefit to, the, to having the school committee involved. Um, on the other hand, this is a board of selectmen. Ultim you know, ultimately, the buck stops here, right. and and so that's why I made the suggestion. Okay. You and Barry to sit down, and then you know. I have no idea. We'll try to get that yeah. done this week. Um, Question six, yep. before we talk about the amount, uh, yep. I would vote yes. That's actually a really good point. Yeah, that's I mean, a very that's good point. point. And you know, you could rephrase that question to say, the average home worth six hundred thousand dollars, or you know, something like that. Yeah, right. I mean, because well, that's so how we gave out the information last time was the thousand dollars was based on your average home of five hundred thousand. Correct. And we were all thinking that when we wrote, or you wrote six, and we read it and said, "Yep, that's what the question was." I actually want. think that's really that's a very that's good really observation. Good. We all were assuming that in the language. Um, also on two P. So, so fix it, Bob. <laughs> Way to delegate. Uh, so 2B, uh, as it reads here, it's... Or not 2B. Yes. Uh, uh, answer L, fourth one down. Uh, I'm retired and on a fixed income. One of the things that this doesn't address, um, I, I have no issue with that question in and of itself, um, but it doesn't address those residents that are living paycheck to paycheck that maybe aren't seen. Could you fix that by changing the and to an or? Or maybe not fixed income, but somehow rephrasing it to address those people in town that maybe don't have as much disposable income and this might be a hardship. And when we talk about collecting data, those residents should be taken. So category one is I'm retired, and category two is and category two is I'm on a fixed income. I guess. Do we need to know your retirement? Well, it's, uh, maybe what you're really saying is there are people in town, and I know this is true, who are at their spending limit. It's yeah. Like I mean, it's like I have no, no more disposable hardship. income, um, and that's why I'd have to vote no. Someone has an inversion. Yeah. It's a financial hardship. 
Oh, okay, that's where I yeah. that was in. It's got words smithed out yeah. in one of the reversions. Yeah. Because you, you know, and you don't have to be retired on a fixed income in order to be at your spending limit. Yeah. So if we had another letter offering there, which would say I'm at my spending limit, <coughs> would that satisfy? We'll just, we'll just say we did take it up with to say, um, you know, I'm suffering from financial hardship and I can't afford to pay anything. I, yeah, I think that's the right yeah. answer, really. Oh, that's right. Swap it out. Would be better because when, if you cross reference it with the age bracket, yep. you'll, you'll get the retired. I think the retired thought here came from the uh, senior tax relief comment at the end. That's probably how it got. That was a nice way to sneak that in there. Yeah, good, good pick. I think that's how that happened. Although I do think it's important to get that. That's one more message. Yeah, that's what I thought. One more way for us to let people be aware that there may be a solution to their yeah. big concern. Well, I don't want to vote for an override because I'm just making ends meet. But maybe they didn't really realize that there's a way to get a thousand dollars back, okay. you know, out of the senior tax relief program. So I do think that you got. I mean, that I I clearly understand that that's a commercial message, but it's I think it's a well placed one. Okay. For the purposes of what we're trying to do, um, so maybe the solution there is add a different one where it's yeah. Right. Add, I'd say add rather why than why don't we subtract. Add a, why don't we add a new letter L and say um, what do we say? I have financial heart that hardship. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm having I'm, financial I'm, hardship. I'm in, having a financial hardship and, and cannot afford to cannot afford more. additional expenses, and that is that has to be age neutral because it's an age neutral kind of situation, frankly. I mean, frankly, it was it was a lot more, I, I mean, I'm retired now. There was a lot of times when I was in my 30s where I was had a lot less money to spend than I do on my fixed income today, you know? I mean, I think that's just a natural fact. And in question five, um, I struggled with this one. Uh, is the one that compares us to peer communities and whether our tax bill is higher or lower. Uh, wearing my FinCon hat, I don't on this one. And my concern is, again, the point of reference is tough on this one because depending on the community, we're being compared <coughs> to home values, property loss. Um, I, I think I, I, Bob added this question, and, and I think it, the point of reference is really important because it, it gives us a starting point of what people think their tax is. Yeah, this is perception. This is a question all about perception. It's not about accuracy. It's knowing what you know today. Do you think that we're higher? or lower, or I have no idea. And yeah. Since you uh, I'm asking, and you know the answer. Lexington, the average of our peers is the exact same as Reading for a single family home okay. within $10,000. Even though the values of the homes are yes, higher. Yes, absolutely. Which is a driver around this question. It's something you certainly have to consider. I mean, you could have the rates could be could be the same, but the tax could be much higher, or the rate, our rate could be lower, you know, yet I, there is a, the, you're not going to get this one perfect, I don't yeah. think. Um, I will say the, the wording on this one is tough to follow. I don't know if we yeah, can. It's, five needs to look like six, Yeah, visually. I just haven't You sort of got to get it back, because I think, Bob, what you were driving at is the average home again. Yeah. And so I mean, if you can pull that in, that may address the issue. Six is format exactly. You know, if the average home in Lexington, for example, is worth twenty percent more, and the tax rates are the same, the tax, the taxes, the physical taxes being paid to fund what's going on there are larger. You know, even though the rate, you know, even though our, you know, the rate might be smaller, if you follow what I'm saying. So it might make more sense to. Make the person, you know, put them in a peer community average single family home and say, how much more or less do you think you're paying there compared to Reading? Instead of Reading compared to someone else, you just move to an average peer community. So turn it around. Yeah. You're, n you're now living in the same you're house. Living in a peer community average, do you think you're paying more or less taxes there? Yeah, I, we want to know yeah, what that, they I mean, think. That's kind of really that's that an easier that way to ask the question. I think so. Do you want to try to wordsmith that right now? No, I'll figure that out. Yeah, right. because that ultimately becomes a marketing discussion yeah, that's okay. in the fall and in the winter. 
if you know this information, if you know how people are thinking, on, and so that's why it's it's got to stay. It needs a little work, but, you know. Okay, so we have a little bit of work to do here to pretty this up. Well, while Bob's working on that, you guys go have your visit with yeah, Chuck we'll and Gene, and you know. Um, I don't know who. Chuck and Elaine. Chuck and Elaine. Chuck and Elaine. Chuck and Elaine. I don't know about your job, John, but in the interest of time and not having to wait another couple weeks to vote on this, I'm happy. Uh, I would put this in their hands. Is that where you're going? Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, we got some wordsmithing on six. The other ones I think are already done, but or five, we already know. But we all know what five means, but I understand there's a better way to cast the question. So we'll, we'll set up a meeting this week. I'm tied up tomorrow and uh, Thursday night. And then you'll let us know the best way to get people to take this. In survey. the meantime, Bob, can we, while that work is going on, can we in the background be moving towards a decision? And I think we need to leave that in your hands. The electronic. Is it Survey, yeah. survey yeah. Monkey? Yeah. Who is it? You know, yeah, I mean. I'll ask Jenna. And the, the Survey Monkey has really worked well. I, I've, I've used, used it in myself. many different organizations. Okay. And I know has used it extensively. As long as you can cross tab. Yes. And that, that's fine. Yeah. Um, thank you for everyone in the audience for your comments. We um, take them all seriously. I hope that's evident. Um, in some cases we may not agree, but um, in most cases I think the, the beauty part of what you've done is you've walked in with um, new eyes. We're seeing the same words over and over again. They mean something to us. You're seeing it for the first time and you're saying, hey, I'm tripping over this sentence or, hey, I don't understand this. So that's the value of having another set of eyes. So I appreciate that. Um, we'll get it done. And take us another few days we'll get it done. Any other comments before we move on? Thank you again for your help. Okay. Um, let's see, the next topic. You should have a motion on uh, the change in officer. Yeah, you're back up. Yeah. I need to. Excuse me. Sorry. Right. Uh, want to take, take a two minute? Yeah, that would be great. Bio break?
Board of Selectmen approve the change of officer beneficial interest application for an annual all alcoholic beverage restaurant license, Pepper Dining, Incorporated, DDA Chili's, 70 Walkers, Brook Drive, Reading, Mass. So I have a second. Second. The subject was in your uh, packet over the weekend. Yep. It's formulaic. Uh, just a change of officer. Yep. All right. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Four zero. Uh, next is the uh, approval of minutes from uh, June 13th. Does any of you have any um, changes to suggest for the minutes? I have three extremely small ones. Okay. On page 6A2, um, I just think uh, it says something. This doesn't sound quite right. Paragraph? 6A2. It's the, it says where the, the com, it has the word compromise in it. Say two. Um, under the driveway cur hearing, driveway curb cut at 69 Hanscom. Yep. It says the request was brought to the PTTTF where it was compromised. Where, where compromise was reached. Yeah, something, something like that. Okay. okay. That's it. Okay. And, and, and that you want me to keep going? Yep. Um, the the public safety transportation public safety training, training just needs an introductory sentence about who was doing the pre who was presenting. I think. Okay. Um, and then um, that's it. That's all I got. Okay. Any other comments or changes? Um, do you have a motion, Barry, to I accept did, the minutes? Oh no, I did not. I move to accept the minutes of June third. Second. As amended. As amended. As amended. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, we have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Four zero. And um, we will now move to executive session with a roll call vote. Do you want to move the motion? Uh, move to go to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, and that the chair declare that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the body, and to adjourn, not returning to open session. This is a roll call vote, so I'll ask for your vote. Andrew. Yes. Barry. Yes. John Arena. Yes. John Halsey. Yes. We're out. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Moving next door. Talk.